everyone. Uh, thank you for being here with us today. We're very happy to see that we have so many people interested uh, in this uh, event. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Stella, I'm the design officer here at Thinker Makerspace. Um, we are very happy that this is a, a starting point of this series of events that we have um, about this workshop that is called Turning the Wheel, where we'll be exploring uh, local materiality and its potential for CNC extrusion. Uh, today is the first day of this uh, event, let's say. Uh, we have a series of talks by our guest visitors, uh, Joel and Kevin, and uh, our local experts, um, Susanna Petriv, Vasos Dimitriou, and Melita Akuta, who's over there. Thank you all for your contribution. Um, my colleague, Stradis, um, is the one responsible <laughs> Uh, for the machine that you can see, the CNC extruder, he developed it um, from scratch. Like he, he has been working really hard on that. Um, so Stratis is going to start with a short introduction about our space, about Thinker Maker space, and about the process that uh, he followed for the creation of the CNC extruder, extrusion machine. Thank you again for being here. Now to you, Stradis. All right, thank you. I will, um, does this work? Mm -hmm. but I'll take off my mask. All right. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, the poem, as we say in Greek. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, us, the thinker maker space here at Science. And then a little bit about uh, the extruder we made. And then we'll give the floor to everyone else to, so today's like an introduction. We get to meet each other, learn what each uh, one of us is doing and what we will be doing. And we hope to see you again uh, throughout this week and next week that we'll be having a series of events uh, going on. Right, so the Thinker Maker Space is uh, funded by the European Union the, Cyprus, the Nicosia Municipality, the Cyprus government, and the structural funds from the EU in partnership with um, all of the state universities of Cyprus and Max Planck uh, Institute and UCL. In a way, we are partnering. All right, this, our structure, uh, we belong to what is called the Science Center of Excellence. It's a research and innovation center, and uh, we're sort of uh, semi-independent uh, entity inside the science, the Thinker Maker Space. And it's a creative space. We target everyone with a creative curiosity, anyone, everyone and anyone. Our main objectives, to assist the creative and uh, cultural industries, to encourage technology-led innovation, support entrepreneurship, ins uh, inspire uh, creativity, and so on. Uh, we do this by providing access to a variety of equipment and tools. When you walk around these next few days, you'll see much more of what we have to offer. Right? We can uh, consult with anyone about uh, designing, whether it's from a design perspective, an engineering perspective. And we offer technical support to our members. We organize programs, talks, and workshops like uh, this one that's uh, starting off today. We have artist residencies. We have uh, three at the moment. Nemo is here, and uh, Nicolina, and uh, Maria is not here. And uh, we also have interns who come and help us. George is, uh, you'll see his work in, uh, as we go along. Okay, our facilities, we have a workshop area. This is the main one. We have electronics and robotics uh, area where we developed a 3D printer, a media desk that we have cameras, drones, and all kinds of different uh, equipment for our members, wooden metal, metal stations, and the exhibition area. Very important when everything at the end uh, comes together. Right, here's our team. Marios is the mastermind behind the makerspace. Right? If it wasn't for him, there would be nothing here, guaranteed. 
Uh, there's me and Marius were uh, two technicians and Alex now, he started as an intern, but we, it was very good, so we <laughs> managed to hire him. <laughs> Maria, you see her graphics everywhere and uh, maybe you know her, Giriagi and Stella, right? So here are some projects we've done recently. This is a geodome project and uh, I mean it's been done before but we were working on uh, designing um, the connections so that they can be laser cut out of uh, sheet metal without any bending, without any welding. So it's easy to manufacture. And uh, I think this one we took it apart and we gave it to, we're lending it to NEMAC for the moment and, but we're planning to build a bigger metal one maybe outside here, if everything goes well. This is another of the projects we've done. Alex actually did it. He came in as an intern and uh, we passed it on to him. It we, we was something that we had been thinking about and he took it on all to himself and uh, actually made a really nice uh, end result. It's on the wall, it will start working maybe tomorrow <laughs> again. It's, uh, we call it a V-plotter. So it's a type of CNC machine actually. We send it uh, the drawings in JPEG format and then it will uh, move around as needed to draw the picture on the, on the wall or on the, on the glass in this case. It was one of the more interesting things we've done. Traffic lights, we repurposed. Uh, there, there's an example. I don't have it now, on, uh, but it's, uh, it's got a little Arduino in it and we can control it on our phone and we can make it play sequences or switch the colors, signal our mood. Sometimes we don't want people coming in. <laughs> so we get the, the flashing, uh, flashing red. Um, we repurposed them. There was a whole uh, mountain load of uh, traffic lights in the Agora before they began the renovation and they were throwing them out by the, so we managed to get a couple of them. This is uh, another project. This is an open source um, hand. It moves with servo motors and it's also got muscle sensors. So it can actually detect what you're trying to do and move, uh, move the fingers. It was an open source, we basically copied this, but uh, it was still an achievement uh, putting it together in one day. <laughs> Those who were here will know <laughs> what I'm talking about. Another thing we dealt with, this is, uh, we call it soft robotics. This is basically silicon, uh, two-part two silicon, we mix it and we make the mold with our 3D printer or with the laser cutter and so on. And we made these uh, silicone things with air bubbles inside and then you can inflate them. We call it soft robotics because these things can be used maybe on a robotic hand as a gripper or something uh, much more uh, comfortable, uh, easier to deal with than you know, a metallic uh, hand was quite interesting and actually we'll be doing more on this uh, soon with uh, Nicolina. She's planning to make a whole suit which will play the pipe or organ pipes uh, if all goes well. Some other projects we did with our uh, previous resident artist. He uh, had some memorabilia from his grandfather and we, might, we added some functionality to it. Like this ashtray was uh, copied, we laser scanned it and printed it. And with electronics and uh, servos, we had it, um, there was a, a proximity sensor and when you got near it, it would um, give out uh, some smoke, some steam, or some smell that he made from, uh, uh, what's it called, I don't know, Ger geranium. More examples of things we've done. This is a bust, it was up, there's up, up there some, we painted them now. This is all laser cut, so it was designed on uh, 3D laser cut into pieces and then we stuck all of them together and uh, gave us a way for using our VRs. A loom, again laser cut. Uh, so we tried to design everything to be flat packed so that we can cut it out of uh, sheets and uh, assemble it. Marisa Sacha did this when she was here as an artist resident. We've collaborated with various MRGs. This is um, with uh, Science Ithaca and uh, the Larnaca Tourism Board and the Maritime Institute. They were mapping uh, the diving routes of Cyprus. 
and we help them a little bit with the photogrammetry. It's, uh, and they, they ended up making the 3D models that uh, you can actually uh, go around in, in the computer and uh, go into different places. You can see this on our website as well, on the screen they will be playing. No need to spend too much time. Uh, felt other MRGs develop uh, products. This was uh, designed and uh, made by Mario Scaralambus. So it attaches a camera because they do some uh, gesture, um, facial recognition. So they wanted to have a camera in the correct position to capture the gestures, smiling and so on, for machine learning. And more similar things. Some pieces we made for the Vienna, Venice Biennale. For uh, some, some artists came here and used our facilities to 3D print and make molds and, uh, and make their models and so on. So we do loads of stuff as you can see. <laughs> this is an example from a Lidra Palace uh, exhibition where we scanned original um, uh, furniture and uh, things from the Lidra Palace and we reproduced them. And then other, other teams, uh, research teams from science uh, helped with the exhibition, making it more uh, uh, interactive and so on. It was, it's quite interesting, actually. Annual events, this is uh, a big one because we're going to be repeating it again this year. Uh, it's our uh, showcase exhibition, which is called the Work in Progress. And we aim to have uh, students and faculty and artists and so on who are working on any technology related art. Actually, our, uh, uh, we have a pretty broad. Uh, actually, you had your students, Joel, come uh, from when they came. Maybe you'll see some pictures or yeah. from the lens. So we, Anyway, I'm blabbering. We started this last year, it was our first uh, in November. Uh, we started small to get things rolling and this year we hope it will be bigger. And you'll be welcome to come and participate or come and visit. It will be announced pretty soon in open call and anyone who's interested would love to have you. We organize talks and workshops like uh, like now we did electronics. This is the uh, wood turning. We had the, uh, some excellent craftsmen from Limassol who came and uh, had some good fun printing, photography. So pretty broad. Uh, and we exhibit the work of, these are uh, the wood uh, turned uh, um, Zvura. Spinning tops that we <laughs> exhibited from our artists in residence, and these are from our artists in residence. So we try to have at least something every month, right? If you if you're interested, you can find. Will you, I'm sure you'll find many interesting things to come and see. We have a residence, as I said. Uh, well, only Nemo you can see. Annie Golina as well. You these are her hands. Uh, and uh, it's Maria. I always forget the names. I mix them. Uh, but All right, so that was a little bit about our space. Okay, anyone who's interested can come again anytime and uh, we can expand more on that. Uh, as I said, just a recap, you can come and do a lot of things here. You can come and see a lot of things here and maybe learn something. Right, and I'm going to talk a little bit now about the paste extruder that we've uh, created. Okay. So I'm starting with a picture of um, this was made by someone called uh, Brian Sira, and it's uh, he designed this extruder and it's open source. He's got all the plans, all the things on the internet, and it's been on Marius's mind uh, even before he hired anyone here. It was just uh, by himself. So even from the first days when we came here, like a couple of years ago, he presented this to us and said, this is really interesting. It's something that we should be doing. And of course we agreed, but we did nothing. 
And uh, recently, by, with the chance of uh, inviting Joel and Kevin to come and uh, host this, uh, this workshop with us, we got uh, the inspiration and the thing to actually go ahead and do something. Right, so the ceramic printing is relatively new, not entirely new. I mean, things have been done in the past. I wrote some uh, names, just uh, Brian Sira, who has the open source uh, project that we got inspired by. We followed some of his, uh, Jonathan Keep was very helpful. He's got, wrote a whole book about printing with uh, ceramics and some things. Um, I'm gonna say that initially, I mean, there's art, the, uh, ceramic 3D printing has two aspects to it. One of them is the artistic. And there's also an industrial uh, aspect to it because uh, ceramics in general with silica and alumina and so on are very, very interesting materials and they have a lot of applications, aerospace and so on. So uh, recently there are industrial grade machines appearing in the market and you can find and you can uh, do very deep. Even they do uh, bone implants that dissolve in the bloodstream and so on with very specialized materials. Okay, so the first machines, they are basically like 3D printers, but people are hacked, they hack them. You change the extruder head and then it, uh, it takes some time to set it up and get it to do what you want. And then you can print uh, ceramics. There's different kinds. There's, um, this is like an XYZ normal 3D printer. There's uh, Delta printers, which uh, hang from similar to our V-plot server with three. So you can move in three dimensions. There's uh, robotic arms, can be adapted to, to hold an extruder and so on. Uh, we decided to go with a screw design, an auger screw and a piston. You can, I'll can give you a tour around the machine a little bit later as well. I've got some pictures. Uh, it was interesting, the process for us as well. Uh, we designed this, uh, this is the screw that's in the actual extruder. Uh, Marius designed it on, uh, on the 3D software. We printed it in wax. So these ones you see, you see here are wax. So we print, our printer can do castable wax and then we took it to a metal um, smith who made a cast of the wax from the wax model and cast it in bronze. Of course we had to clean it up and, and everything. But we learned uh, some things as well, which was interesting. So we decided to go with this method, with a uh, screw extruder and a piston pushing the thing. We decided to go on a gantry type of uh, system rather than the, the smaller, the square boxes or the, the other uh, types that I mentioned. And I put this picture because I, from the, uh, they are actually selling them on India Mart or there's an advertisement for them. But <laughs> I don't know if you can see it or if anyone can notice it, but there's a, a mistake with it. It's a rendering, it's not an actual picture. It's a, like an impossible um, Escher type of uh, <laughs> geometry. If you can see it maybe. Like, the, if the, the, um, the, this, it's got two heads on the x-axis, but they have different y-coordinates. If you can, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so we went with the idea of the gantry and you'll see it because uh, um, the main reason is that we can actually extend one of the axes and make big things. Uh, of course, uh, the size of our printer is way too big for the things that we'll be printing, especially these, uh, these first few days because we haven't really worked out everything. Uh, can't make the clay hold, I don't think. And uh, but yeah, we went with the idea of the gantry because then we can uh, extend the rails and make it even longer. In theory, it can be infinite. So we, I, I mean, we can put tracks like a railway and make it print one hole uh, in theory. Something for the future, maybe. Right, and this is just an example I found uh, on the internet of printing, because it's one of the things we want to do, is print benches along the sidewalks and uh, something big when we, get, when we get there. This was, of course, printed with a robotic arm, printed by Incremental 3D. And 
Okay, this is much more complicated because there's many additives in here with carbon sheets and uh, reinforced uh, fibers and so on because for it to hold and become uh, structurally stiff. But this is something that we're hoping for the future and it's one of the reasons why we actually built a big machine so that we can have uh, in the future the uh, ability to adapt and make other things as well. So it's, it's like a platform for us to begin uh, experimenting. So what we did, we started, after we decided on what we were gonna do, we started designing it. Marius, who was not here, made all the different parts. We used um, open build uh, hardware, which is, uh, they have standard sections and wheels and everything that fits together. But we had to mix and match, of course, and uh, many different iterations <laughs> of everything. As you can see, I mean, the, that pile is a big mess, but some, somewhere in here are the final parts. This is the one we have on there now, but we're already working on the next uh, iteration and so on. So it's a great learning experience for us as well. Okay, so we used the off-the-shelf uh, parts. Uh, we ordered them, we put them together. We made uh, some uh, custom brackets and so on to get everything working some of them which were failures. Like this is held now with the clamp, but we've, we're waiting for the metal uh, replacement one of these days. Here's some more of the bronze uh, fittings we made that had adapters that we couldn't find uh, available. We got the parts, we put it together. I think this is a little video George made. We have a resident photographer and uh, cinematographer. That's the extruder screw, the, the, uh, the bronze. He was always chasing us around, taking pictures as we were progressing. Fine tuning there. <laughs> you can see that not all the parts fitted together as they should have, so we had to modify them. Get everything adjusted. Yeah, different uh, shots of us putting it together. We're pretty happy with the accuracy, actually. From the first uh, time, uh, and we finally got to push some clay out of the extruder. And this was a couple of days ago. So this is a very fresh uh, experience for us. We hope we'll, with the expert help we have uh, imported from, uh, from Zurich, that our level of uh, confidence will uh, increase dramatically in the next uh, couple of weeks. And we'll get to play with it for over the next 10 days and uh, learn from it and try different things. And <laughs> save the best for last. <laughs> okay, open source uh, software using the Duet, uh, uses this kind of, for anyone that's interested language, RepRap, which is replicating rapid prototypes. I found this out last night. So it's uh, <laughs> similar to our theme, uh, theme logo. But uh, we chose this because it's open source. It's very well documented. There's uh, great communities online. And uh, the possibilities are endless of what we can do with this machine, what we can add. And these are our first prints. This one was actually done on Friday, and this one was done yesterday. And we're going to do a couple more today, and then uh, starting from tomorrow, getting more and more into it. All right, as a recap, just to let you know what's going on this uh, next couple of weeks. This is today. So we will uh, get to meet each other. You'll meet um, Joel, Kevin, Melita, Susanna, and Vasos. We have the next couple of days. The, tomorrow and Friday, we'll be going on a tour around Cyprus. Not everywhere, of course, because time is limited, but we'll be going. You can search our website and you'll find the full uh, time, and because it's always updated, so you'll find the latest there if you want to come and join us. There might be one seat left on the bus, from what I've heard. <laughs> we'll have to speak with Stel. Right, but anyone can come along the way and join us. 
our main uh, theme would be looking at local materials and uh, we'll be going uh, to meet also local craftsmen doing traditional work. Next week, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll be here all day outside in the square and we'll be making prints and interacting with people and we'll have master classes from, uh, you'll find all the information on our website. And then we've got, at the end of the week, we'll be exhibiting uh, what we come up with. Right, and there's also, of course, what we have already exhibited that's gonna be running throughout. Uh, uh, that's it for me. Any questions? <laughs> no, Maria. Yeah. <laughs> Carlos Ores. Uh, so have you fired no. any of the, okay. Maybe today no, we have, have a must. We'll make a couple of things today, tomorrow, and so on, and then uh, we'll hopefully we'll fire it by the weekend or by Monday, so that at the exhibition we'll have also some fired stuff and some unfired. And... But from previous work. From much more uh, efficient machines. <laughs> is, ours is still. Sorry? It's made in Limassol. Actually, if our machine was finished a month ago, which was the initial plan, we would have experimented with different clays and different things. But it was, it was finished yesterday. So we have to do what we've got. Sorry? Okay. Yeah. Okay. A cubic meter? But yeah, especially next week when we're in the square, you'll have a chance if you're interested to come and uh, get your hands dirty and see how things uh, learn with us because we'll, we'll be learning as well. Uh, all right, uh, Bella, I'm done. Uh, <laughs> Can I go? <laughs> like, thank you, Stradi, for your presentation. And now uh, uh, Mirto is going to tell you a few words about uh, the START program. Mirto is, Mirto is from the uh, Itika group. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm going to be really quick because the interesting stuff comes later on. So uh, welcome uh, to all of you again. Uh, I just wanted to mention that this uh, series of events and workshops that are taking place are under the auspices of the STARTS uh, project uh, for, for which we are part as a regional START Center this year. So uh, STARTS stands for Science, Technology and Arts, um, and it tries to bring in together, as you understand, these three elements and find the, the synergies and the, the meeting points. Uh, so here with ITIGA, uh, science uh, um, thinker makerspace, uh, we're hosting also uh, events, relevant events and, uh, under the Starts Academy's uh, umbrella. And we also have our Starts uh, residence artist, Joseph Hovadik, he's right behind there. And uh, he's been working already on his project, Cyprus Vital Science, which focuses on Cypriot locality, uh, the toll of tourism on Cyprus and sustainable uh, ways of thinking forward uh, uh, towards this subject. So yeah, uh, we're really excited to, to have this amazing event. It's part of reading the locality and understanding uh, what is uh, truly Cypriot and what can be also truly Cypriot through technology and synergies with artists and makers. So thank you. Thank you, Mirto. Um, so now we can uh, start with uh, presentations. First from our guests, uh, Joel Piton, if I'm not, if, I'm pronouncing, if I killed your name, I'm really sorry. Um, so Joel will be the first one to present. Um, one second.
Thank you. Just a note for when you're doing Q and A after the presentation, if you wait two seconds to be passed on the microphone, because we have people online and they would like to listen also to what is said. So, or we repeat the question. Um, thank you, and I'm really excited to be here, and I really. Wanted to thank a lot uh, Mario, Stratis, Stella, and the whole team at Science uh, Thinker Makerspace for this invitation and this opportunity to be here. I feel very uh, overwhelmed by the warmth of the welcome I've received uh, so far. Uh, so uh, and I will present first and then Kevin. It's going to be sort of a, a dual presentation in the sense that we, are, we have very, very different practices. So that's kind of the interesting part of how we are collaborating together. Uh, Kevin has more an architectural, structural engineering presentation related, and I'm a little bit more uh, radical in my approach. Um, so I call this uh, embodied fabrication, and I will come to the notion of what do I mean by embodied fabrication? Um, and I'm pursuing oddness. So. Uh, I just, uh, I'm, I'm the kind of person who only really appreciates um, things that are uh, odd, strange, uh, queer in that sense. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so as an artist, I'm really, what I'm interested in mostly is this notion of mixing the familiar and the strange. Uh, so I'm interested of what is familiar in the, in the strange and what is strange in the familiar. Um, I, I also sort of have a nomadic stress disorder. Uh, I have, I'm from Paris originally, but uh, uh, as a child of immigrants, I've kept uh, the tradition of immigrating a little bit everywhere. Uh, so uh, those are the cities and the places that have welcomed me and my research. I've been very fortunate that I have sort of followed a uh, lot of trends and lots of places who have pioneered the relationship between art, design and research. Uh, the latest one that I'm in is uh, Tata de Ka. It's in Zurich. It's a Zurich um, uh, uh, Hochschule der Kunst, so it's the University of the Arts in Zurich, where I teach and do research in interaction design. Uh, this is my website, I'll put the link at the end, it's called freeradicals.io, uh, and you can see the breadth of my sort of work and teaching and workshops that I do. Um, one of the topic I'm particularly interested in is this notion of intimacy at distance. And I'm presenting a little bit this context so that I arrive to this uh, encounter I've had with clay extrusion. How did I come to that? I think it's really uh, sort of a past that explains a lot the interest I have with using these technologies. I'm not a technologist per se uh, to start with, but my life has always been sort of intertwined with these technologies. Um, so this is an installation I did already 15 or 18 years ago. I'm not getting any younger. Uh, and, uh, and it was basically trying to have people who were living in different places meet through their interaction with their shadow. So a person could be, let's say, in Dublin and inside the the body uh, silhouette line, they would see the shadow of a person maybe being in Paris. Uh, and the more they would move, the more they would see the shadow of the other person. I did a similar work later on. Uh, again, what I'm interested in in this particular sen sense is really using the body uh, as an interface. So movement and the body makes the catalyst for interactivity. Here are people and basically uh, it's, a, it's a ground projection. As they move, they can see uh, more of the scenery. It was exhibited in Japan uh, in a tea house, and it was about also discovering the detail of contemplation. 
Uh, I work a lot with, uh, and this is probably my favorite part, and this is also why I, I love this sort of events and these sort of opportunities. I work a lot in workshop and community outreach setting. Uh, this is uh, uh, an event I curated in Newcastle in the UK, Connected Communities, uh, some 10 years ago. Uh, and this is something that for me is very crucial, is how do I meet uh, communities with the sort of art and design and research that I do? Uh, and how do I uh, sort of learn from also uh, what uh, arts are being, um, what kind of art is being able to offer opportunities to meet, discuss, uh, and also as an object of conversation, really. Uh, I then, around that time, started to look into digital fabrication. Uh, and this was one of my first early work with printing items that I considered uh, daily, sort of uh, items of daily life that I could find on the internet. This is a, a tube of, um, of a glue, a glue tube. This is a scotch tape a roller. Uh, this is an egg uh, rocket. This is a Lego. So I, I picked the items that were the most casual in order to uh, get people to really relate to this technology. Um, and, and I created, inspired by some conceptual uh, poetry of the 30s and 40s, I created a poem uh, where I displayed the, those items in a certain way. Um, and it was a way for me to investigate digital fabrication in maybe ways that were not so um, investigated at the time. Um, and then I went on to do a doctoral degree at Harvard University around this topic, because I started to think, how do I talk about digital fabrication in ways that are um, relatable, accessible, and fun? Uh, I'm very inspired by pop culture. This is the excerpt of uh, Marvel Comics, Silver Surfer. And Silver Surfer is this uh, figure of a superhero coming out of outer space. Uh, and he's his own 3D printer. Uh, so he's printing his surfboard out of his own body. Um, and for me, this is uh, pretty much what I'm trying to explore is how do we generate things from ourselves. So when I talk about embodied fabrication, we are getting close to that. A researcher at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts, Neil Gershenfeld, who's heading, who's been really a pioneer in those technologies, been heading the Center for Bits and Atoms since uh, the 90s. Uh, and he created a, a, a course that I was lucky to take called How to Make Almost Anything. Uh, it's an MIT course. It's uh, now available in different countries and cities. So you can follow also courses online. Uh, and he had an interesting, in an interview in 2013, he had an interesting proposal. He says, what's emerging now is a science of digital fabrication that lets you turn data into things so we can program the physical world. So his idea is that you can really turn your data into things. Uh, this is pretty much what's been done. So I was like, okay, let's do, let's try. Um, and so those are first tests made with styrofoam of uh, data turned into patterns and into geometries. Uh, it was it's a project uh, called Tweetology, and it was basically I gathered tweets from Twitter. That's 2012, 2013, uh, and created assigned some geometries to those words. Um, and then generated figure. Those are about, each item is about uh, six centimeters by eight or something on this proportion. And I wanted to expand the scale of that. So um, Kevin here also really helped me. Uh, we, we were lucky to have very great facilities at Harvard uh, with really big, big beds of milling machines and we were able to create a full landscape. So this is a kind of an inspiration again of a Japanese garden where each detail is generated by Twitter, basically. Those are uh, close-ups. 
close-ups of the of the installation um, and you can see here that there is really extremely intricate details formed uh, by the data and the idea was to really create a full landscape a full garden uh, based on twitter data and, uh, and have people sort of enjoy the place <laughs> Another uh, item I created from uh, data turning into, into things and programming the physical world. This is a robot called Rabota. Uh, and it's a, basically, it's a, little, it's a little guy, it's a little friend. It's almost like a pet uh, that is basically controlled by your sleeping data. So when you're asleep, this robot is alive. Uh, and it's, uh, it's driven by the, the data that you create, you generate where, when you're sleeping. Um, sorry, I'm not used to clickers. Um, so the idea was that it would uh, reinvent the landscape of your, of your room while you're sleeping. Uh, maybe I show you a, a brief few seconds of video. Uh, I can escape, right, and minimize. Um, do you want to, uh, I don't want to open the wrong. Yeah. This was exhibited. Yeah. So, you can play two seconds. And then, uh, so that's uh, Rabota. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, it was very, uh, very important for me to design a, a whole, a, a really strong learning experience to, to make a machine and to create a robot, I have to say. Um, and uh, we go back to, yeah, the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. So um, going back to this notion of oddness, to this notion of familiar in the strange, strange in the familiar, uh, Gordon Pask, who, who was an artist in the 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, into cybernetics, had a really interesting thoughts about machines. Uh, machines, we are surrounded by machines. We use machines all the time. Uh, our life is, is, machines are sort of modern companions uh, of our time. I'm sure you have a, rela a strong relationship with your phone and with your computer and with your car and any sort of machine, with your washing machine. I'm sure there's some sort of kinship there. Uh, and, and Garden Past really had this proposal of looking at at uh, ma what he called maverick machines. So maverick has also encapsulate this notion of oddness, oddity, strangeness, radicality, rebelliousness, um, where basically is, is, this proposal is that it's, in, it's an invention that deviates from the mainstream, uh, but that nevertheless of value. And this is really what my work is also very much about. It's this count, what I call this counter-functionality, this notion of not being in the expectation of what, what a machine is supposed to do, but trying to embrace rather the maverick aspect, the rebel, the rebel side of the machine. Uh, and, uh, and so further on in this way, it's kind of a, a way of living in the material world, I would say. Sorry. <laughs> Doesn't work. Huh? <laughs> I know. I have to click. Ah. 
I think it's stuck actually. No. Ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> um, so another quote for you. Um, so what I'm interested in, in the last few years, I've really also embraced this idea of non-human centric approaches. Uh, I think we are we we need to decenter ourselves from a lot of different things, and one of them is also this idea of really trying to understand how the how our relationship with the world functions, how the place of technology, the place of machines, um, and uh, and there's a lot of researchers also looking at. Uh, indigenous researchers looking also at this notion of kinship, um, this notion that we can extend kinship to not just a network of, of humans, but animals, plants, wind and rocks, mountains and oceans, and that would also include machines in that sense. Um, so embodied embodiment for me is really also a way of life. It's a form of existentialism. It's it's about being there, being here, which is also why it's important to be here in the presence of, of all of you uh, and allowing ourselves and the, this, this economy, this, this loveliness of attention, being there and being, and, and I, I take the gift of, your, of you listening to me right now really, really with, uh, with so much awe as well. Um, and and fabrication in in that we are in that in that network is uh, is ways to to exist and act upon that world, just like the silver surfer. Um, so I'm again I'm trying to find ways within that to find how digital fabrication, which is which sounds so functional, so practical, so pragmatic, so linear. Um, I try to look at ways that it can become intimate or counterfunctional or intuitive. Uh, this is, I'm just gonna pass very quickly because it's also a course I teach at Seta Deca. Those are some images of projects of students that I've, that I've taught with this in this umbrella. And those are kind of the object they came up with. Um, those are the new types of machines that are very embodied, very corporeal, very intimate, uh, and all using digital fabrications and materials, 3D printing sometimes, uh, but sometimes other types of, of, uh, of fabrication processes. Uh, here is 3D printing uh, sort of uh, on the body itself. Uh, and then I end uh, this uh, sort of, uh, that's the last part of my talk, uh, which comes back to, um, to this, uh, this, to how I put all of the things I just mentioned into, into the, that project of clay printing. Um, so, so some of those projects are, are were part of my doctoral degree when I did and finished it in 2016, but I still continue to work on it. And the latest one is called Streamline. And you can see here some tests uh, that Kevin also helped me make uh, where uh, in this particular case, I'm not necessarily interested in a final functional object, but it's, it's again printing as it's receiving data. Uh, so I'm interested in what I, I would call real-time printing. So not printing with, a, with a, um, a predetermined file, uh, not printing with, a, with an idea necessarily in mind, but trying to print as it's receiving data. So the printer here in this particular case, it's messages that are sent via a chatbot to the printer. Um, and as the messages are interpreted by the machine, then it's printing. Uh, so I'm interested in that latency. Sometimes the one complaint that people have with digital fabrication and 3D printing is like, oh, it takes forever, it's super endless. But actually that's what I would like to use is that time that passes by uh, and the idea of an endless fabrication. Can you imagine if you would let, let it run over and over and over again over maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe a year, it would keep printing. Um, so I'm also interested in this notion of unfinished items. Those are some tests. 
I'm working also in, in Zurich uh, with a former student of mine who has helped me in the last few months also continue the project. Those were done with PLA, but now we're moving back to clay. Um, but uh, what is an object that is always in a state of becoming? Um, some more tests. You can see here the printing starting to, with a particular geometry and starting to, to, um, to start to break away from that geometry. And, um, and it's kind of incorporating uh, what I would call metaphors of decay and abandonment. How you incorporate that also as the, the material transforms itself. And with clay, it's, it's really, it's a double uh, meaning in the sense that clay itself dries as it starts or, or reduces or it's changing uh, property. So as you start printing, it's also already changing nature. Um, so again, I'm, I'm really, I want this project also to, to provoke oldness and otherness and to, to try to understand also what geometries or what properties of geometry can be uh, interesting to experiment with in that sense of counter-functionality. Um, and, uh, and finishing on, on a few more slides, I, why am I particularly interested in this otherness and otherness um, it's uh, because I'm trying to reevaluate re a few things. Uh, this is a completely different project. It's by Guy Chan in Hawaii. And she here is sort of giving weeds a different, um, a different value. So weeds, technically, when you're gardening, weeds are considered weeds. They're considered not valuable, something to get rid of, something to to take away. And here she's showing with her work that weeds have some value that we don't necessarily see. Um, I also have a garden. This is one of my carrots, very proud of it. And uh, through that, I'm feeling like this is what beauty also could look like. Uh, this is also my way of reevaluating the odd and the weird. Uh, I consider myself also undisciplined. This is inspired by, by uh, uh, an architect called Didier Faustino, a French uh, architect who also uses that term and being undisciplined uh, because there is also no particular uh, labeling to have uh, when you're doing so many different creative practices uh, between an architect an artist, a designer, a researcher. So I like, I like the double meaning of being undisciplined. And so um, at the end, it's really for me uh, a, this adventure through digital fabrication and using digital fabrication in a completely different way uh, of a nonlinear, uh, counter-functional, intuitive, intimate, uh, 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 even more in the sense of like refusing a sort of a, a frame where it has to be a linear process is in the end, it's like the same work as that person was doing with reevaluating weeds. Um, here it's also a weed on the streets of Nantes in France. Where, um, where suddenly someone decided to name the weeds that are growing uh, to give them a name and to give them visibility. It's one of the most poetic projects I've ever seen. Um, and so for me, that's also a form of my project in the end, or a lot of my series of work is about embracing, uh, embracing this notion of useless as a way to also embrace the queer, the alien, the refugee, the immigrant, so-called people that are called parasites, uh, but they're actually extremely valuable for our, for our lives. And this is a kind of a loop back to my nomadic stress disorder at the beginning. Um, ah, the last slide is missing. It's okay. <laughs> it was gonna see my face with uh, 
with some information. So it's fine, you have my face here. Um, and uh, you're welcome to, to check my, my work further along and I'll be here for the next two weeks. So I'm really excited to meet you all. Yeah. Thank you very much. And of course, if you have questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Joelle. Very interesting work. Um, are there any questions from anyone? It's okay if it's... it's yeah. not. The little robot was mm -hmm. grinding into the floor. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it was... But like it was... an extra floor, not the... <laughs> Well, the idea is that it would be your real, uh, the real floor of your home. But of course, when it was exhibited, it was a fake, uh, <laughs> fake floor. Yeah, yeah. People are not that uh, <laughs> that <laughs> courageous. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Gerald. That was very, very interesting. Um, just a quick question about your, um, let's say, the objects that come as outcomes of your research, for example, mm -hmm. the ceramic um, uh, object that you showed that was very interesting, the process that it came out of this exchange of messages. Um, nevertheless, you arrived with the with a fabrication of yet another object in the world. Um, how, how does, where actually does this object exist outside the research? Is it only within a kind of research in the university? Do you see it as a design object or an art object? I know you defined it as odd and, and I don't know, undisciplined or queer, yeah. but nevertheless, there it is in the world. So <laughs> yeah, how do you feel about where does it find its place in the world? Uh, that's, a, that's a beautiful question. And thank you very much for asking it. Um, the, the, I don't know, to be honest, because it's, it, you could argue that it's more waste, more objects, more. Uh, I wanted to read it as, uh, at some point I made, uh, I collaborated with a graphic uh, artist uh, because I wanted them to imagine a world where you have a, a whole like accumulation of this on the corner that are text messages transformed into this oddity and it could be like postcards. Uh, so where are postcards fitting into this? Um, I guess it's uh, it's uh, it could be comments also on our on our world where we accumulate this sort of series of items and objects that no longer really have a sense of purpose, um, and that's probably where I would like to put them, like in this in betweenness. It's not a functional object, it's not kitchenware, it's not a decorative per se object. Although, you know, the lines are blurred, sometimes the kitchenware becomes decorative and vice versa. Um, and I think there's a lot of objects that live in this in-betweenness, like postcards um, that we store somewhere. Um, I don't know. I'm 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 hoping that it's I I in my doctoral degree I called them object of a third kind. So I keep up with the theme of like science fiction and and oddness. So it's uh, I call them object of a third kind. I'm not sure where they fit, but uh, that's also why I'm happy to experiment and collaborate with local artists and practitioners because maybe we can find that together as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Hello. Thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, uh, new to my eyes. Um, like, I don't know how it will come uh, out. I don't know if it's a question or like, but um, it's also an impulse from Melida's. Um, like question and also like you said about the space in between and let's say this queerness that it's not in, into this dialectical mode of existing and yes I, I, I see this in terms of like the outcome but like how do you think 
uh, you achieve this through the process because I, for example, like um, sculpture for me, it's a very bodily like um, process. So um, in your practice, I see a disengagement or like a dissociation from the body. Um, although you were talking about embodiment, and this is also a really interesting way to see embodiment as something disengaged. And, and then you also uh, talked about real uh, data, like real time data. Mm -hmm. um, but I am not sure whether I see like um, the space in between, uh, between like control and freedom or like cognition and sensation or whether I could see like these layers in between. So like, um, can you uh, elaborate a little bit on your process and how do you bring these elements in, like this space in between? Yes, um, this is a very, also again, a very, uh, uh, a very uh, amazing question. Um, I guess, so to this notion of embodiment in the process, we think sometimes that, I just wanted to do a little, little quick detour into this idea that digitality has this label on it that it's not embodied or hands-on. But if we think of how our body has been completely invaded by, by our relation with technologies, the computer invented the fact that the computer on the desk imposed for the last 50 years that we're sitting, you know, this like this, that's a very sort of new uh, embodiment, embodied uh, data has probably also changed our landscape. We don't know all the data centers that surround us, but that data is very, very much physical. So there's a lot to start with. I really think there's a lot of embodiment, also building those machines uh, creating, engaging with those mechanisms is extremely embodied, um, uh, although it might seem remote. Uh, and understanding that there's a correlation between our sleeping data, our quantified self, all the data as we're becoming obsessed with measuring how many steps we take, how many kilos we, we, we lose, how many uh, health data we generate. This is also sort of embodied. But in terms of the process of creation, I see your point that, that maybe with sculpture, there is a direct engagement with the materi material and the material is enforced by, by the physicality of the body. Uh, and that's maybe less true indeed for 3D printing with clay. Uh, that said, I think in, in my process, I feel very much that kinship with the machine that I was talking about. And then maybe that's where I see that embodiment as well happening. Um, also in the case of the, the course I'm teaching called Embodied Fabrication, I also see it in, in, that, uh, in that idea that I place the body at the center of also the, uh, of the process because the items are made for the body. So I try to, to circulate around this notion of embodiment that I might differentiate from physical um, action onto the material. But hopefully it's again, maybe something that could be investigated, whether there is a combination of both that could be possible. So, so the idea that you could also intervene uh, with your body onto the material, even though some of it is printed, maybe there's a hybridity there that could be explored. I hope that answers. Um, also your question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank um, you very much. Uh, we will have um, a break after Kevin's presentation. So if you have any more questions, you can feel free to ask. Yeah. Um, well, Thank you, there. Stella. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have a presentation by Kevin King. Yes. Uh, just one second. Oh, that was the slide. Actually. <laughs> 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 
in the program, the title of the presentation was five axis uh, manufacturing career. And, and after um, considering their thinking about context and Joel's work and whatnot, I decided to show um, show a bit also um, just the broader range of working with materials and digital fabrication. Because um, this is where I came into the mix. Um, I worked for about 10 years in construction, um, learning how to build things by doing it. Um, you know, uh, talking to people, learning bits of knowledge from here, practicing there, and really started to work, uh, enjoy working with metal, um, folding, bending, shaping, uh, that type of thing. And some of my earliest projects were working with laser cutter, uh, doing the kind of flat, uh, you know, flat designs and layering those designs, um, you know, into more three-dimensional objects. And, and this is a simple laser cut uh, um, um, uh, paper. Um, but during this process, I learned the, the digital coding and how to incorporate parameters uh, into the design as, as a object that would change the shape, the pattern, the color. Um, and this one, this was a little script that actually, um, um, it, it was a simple code of these density of, of squares, uh, rectangles that were randomly placed and kind of packing in. And depending on how many uh, panels you wanted to overlay, it would also script the box uh, that is uh, in the corner, you know, to kind of fit this uh, packing item. Um, the next one was, again, kind of working with this hands-on material and digital design to create a three-dimensional object. And, and it has no purpose, really, other than the experience of, of coding, but it's based on a simple sets of parameters that change from one element to the next, and then when assembled with a particular set of rules, um, create this kind of three-dimensional shape that was very, to me, it was very animal-like. It was a way of being inspired by nature and trying to understand a more digital code that uh, describes that, that technology. And um, I was fortunate in a series of studios that looked at this material and scripting base, or, material and uh, nature-based inspirations. And here um, I had picked uh, some random uh, shrew from Africa um, as an element of inspiration and studied on it for over a week, just looking at pictures, trying to sketch this, this, you know, this unique animal, um, not really knowing how I would achieve the goal of designing a bridge. And then one night it kind of hits me of how these pieces fit together and I wake up in the middle of the night and draw these little squares together. <laughs> and then <laughs> after a series of hand cut processes and digital processes, I end up with this object on the right. Um, but in between there was a kind of experimentation of combining shape and material and a system together that, that could then you know, introduce this three-dimensional geometry. Um, and uh, it was a pattern of, of image or of, of shapes that I, you know, combined with different rule sets, you know, a small opening, a large opening, gave two different shapes and, and was able to kind of tension them together in, in this object. Um, later in the studio, we worked in a larger team-based uh, process, again, with a, with a nature-based uh, inspiration, this uh, piece of um, broccoli in the upper left-hand corner and some, um, some melted plastic that we melted with a hairdryer, um, kind of created a, um, a more elegant element in, in the lower right. Um, so we had a basic uh, material property, some, you know, some hard rules for geometry production, and then the combination of those two. Um, and with the larger team, we we're able to kind of develop a larger taxonomy of, of options as we looked at uh, plans and how to organize the system and how to actually create a, a, um, a, an object, we, we chose a different um, um, pattern combinations for how to divide the rule set and then started to investigate color codes. And we would print out large drawings and stand back and everybody kind of vote on, you know, what sort of color and pattern combination would, would generate something meaningful for us as a team. And through that process, we settled on one design and then kind of went to the, the, the assembly of it. 
And, um, you know, it took a few weeks to melt pieces, um, lay, uh, paint them in a particular way, uh, combine them, we, we zip tied everything together. And then the last minute hung it from the ceiling as, uh, as an element for the exhibition of, of the studio. Um, in that context, I learned a, a software called Grasshopper. Now to, to learn it, I had to do it. And, and essentially um, took some documentation and wrote uh, like a set of, um, of crib notes for that documentation and made a book out of it. So by forcing myself to make a book, it taught me how to learn that software in the process. And, and so it's, that the, it's really the making by doing that, that has brought me through the last uh, uh, 10, uh, 15 years yeah. or longer really. Um, well, at Harvard, um, we looked uh, at, uh, at um, a screen wall prototype. Um, some of you may know the work of Erwin Hauer, um, uh, dealt with uh, you know, creating these types of geometries by hand with rulers in the 1950s and 60s, I think he started. Um, was fortunate enough to go and meet him at his workshop and the kind of uh, things he's doing today, but we we took the geometry that he was producing and tried to think about how, how we could understand the rules and then rewrite that into the process. Um, this is really the project I learned uh, um, uh, of how to work on the large CNC. Um, we, we glued together these massive uh, timbers um, of poplar um, and then uh, ran it on the, the CNC mill at, at Harvard GSD and uh, with this pattern in the corner. And I think um, this pattern was actually just a map so that we could instruct the CNC operator how to run the software. So we had to draw a set of plans for the operator to <laughs> operate the software. It was kind of this level of complexity was, was dealt into it. And I think that plan is what feeds into my current work today as, as an architect of how to make a rationalization of this kind of abstract uh, process. Um, uh, this was a, just a screen wall prototype that was maybe a meter and a half by a meter tall as, you know, as a, an experiment of, of the 3D shape. Um, later, I uh, was in another studio. We worked with slip casting uh, ceramics. Um, and, and how to kind of rationalize the, a, a flexible geometry that could be assembled into a screen wall. Um, the center uh, lower picture, I used um, a, uh, the CNC control to, to make the details of the flute. So here the, the machine was actually uh, trying to use it as a tool um, for you know, controlling those type of details with a particular head or or a tip of the bit um, for that. In the lower right, we, we use that CNC blank to make a series of molds so we can really uh, mass produce the, these items in the short time we had. I think in three days, we made the 120, 130 pieces, um, just slip casting one after another. Um, the, the prototype assemblies uh, on the upper left, we also experimented with a series of, of glazes to try and you know, understand what it would be to make a gradient. Um, at one point we had them all white laid out on the floor. It was probably the most beautiful <laughs> element just to have that pure white. Um, but it was a process of learning and experimenting with, with the clay and, and digital fabrication together. Um, this kind of leads into my thesis um, where this, all of the work I'd done um, in, during my master's, um, um, well, not all of my work, but a lot of my work was, was working with clay and digital fabrication. And 3D printing clay was, um, I think, um, Jonathan Keep's items had been out for about two, three years, but it was still very early. Um, and I wanted to see what does 3D printed clay mean for the world of architecture and construction, or what can it mean? Um, I was fortunate to have a large team of people to consult with over the process and to, to really, um, um, kind of not guide me, but to, to go to different people to ask different questions. And it was this the sense of community that really kind of allowed me to explore this range. Um, I built a, an open source uh, Delta machine in the lower left there, printed some first te test samples in the upper left, 
um, and and combined uh, a custom uh, extruder that the screw that the the university had already. Um, they built from a, a previous project and combine that with some open source uh, technology in order to mount it on the robots. And this is actually Joelle's project in the upper, upper right there that, that we were printing. Um, I focused my research more on understanding the process, the potential overhangs, uh, trying to think about what can I do to make larger pieces that could then be assembled into a more structural design that can be inhabited. So I use these small tail scale tests to look at the bigger scale picture. Um, and in that process, I combined it with some basic engineering concepts of being able to post tension pieces together. I, I understood that it would be realistic to print a block that's probably maybe 40, 50 centimeters square um, and be able to fire it in a regular way in an industrial process and, and likely achieve some of these post tensioning technologies. Um, combine that to a larger structural system that could uh, be a potential dome. Um, you know, something that could be inhabited on a larger scale built with smaller components. Um, and, um, and of course, I've not tested any of this part, but I am confident with enough time that, you know, it could do larger pieces and, and actually, you know, control that process along the way. So, um, this was a smaller model that we 3D printed for, you know, for purposes of the, the exhibition at the time. Um, uh, some boards that were published in, um, in uh, different conferences, um, trying to understand the basics of the tool path and what are the implications um, for five axis manufacturing and how can that change the, uh, the influence, the actual results. Um, so, you know, the, of, um, uh, our, uh, the, the machine that we'll be using this next week is working in, in three axis, X, Y, and Z. Um, but it is also an option to, to modify or to turn the tool head um, and extrude at, uh, at an angle or around a corner. And you have a bit different uh, compression values in that clay. Um, so with that, I think there's another level of geometry that can be achieved. Of course, there's another level of programming required to achieve that, <laughs> that tool path, but, um, but a lot of this technology is here um, and exists with us today. Um, this led into um, an exhibition that I did with the, the Harvard uh, MAPS research group. Uh, MAPS is material, material systems and processes group. No, material processes and systems group. Um, it's uh, led by uh, Martin Bechtold, um, and they, as uh, one of the sponsors of his research group, is the Sevi Sama, which is a ceramics trade organization from Spain. And each year they sponsor him to do a large ceramic exhibit for their, their larger, more um, industrial kind of uh, um, uh, conference. And that's this year we did, or the year that after I graduated, we did a 3D printed ceramics uh, exhibit. And these are some of the bricks that I've sent to, to Stratus to, to test print um, some pieces we printed before. Um, we had a prototype design of a, about roughly a three meter uh, pyramid. Um, we, we were working with some, some, uh, some climate scientists uh, who wanted to think about thermally active surfaces. So we had a particular um, a geometry for the inside of, of the pavilion. And then we divided the, the system into a rational logic according to brick sizes we, we figured we could print. Um, we worked closely with the ITC, which is a ceramics institute in Castellón, uh, Spain. And they did the printing uh, in Spain. So we would do the design work in, in Cambridge. Um, we'd communicate with them at the end of the day. <clears throat> by morning, they would have sent us new emails telling us about problems from, the, from what they learned the day before. We would modify the structure and send them new G code uh, by the end of our day. And so we'd wake up again and start the process all over. <laughs> so it was kind of an interesting workflow to work with that large time difference. Um, but we generated all of the G code uh, from, from Cambridge and then just sent the simple files to Spain and they printed them there. Um, uh, this was uh, some images of the final uh, production. We did not manage to print everything. Of course, we ran into severe kind of changes in the geometry or collapsing during the process. 
you know, because the, a lot of the overhangs were too extreme or, or those type of things. Um, but we still managed to print a good deal and, and learn in the process and communicate that to the industrial manufacturers because they're wondering, do we start printing? Do we start developing that type of machine? And, you know, meanwhile, they have factories, you know, pumping out uh, large tiles and, you know, and that type of thing. So they're thinking about the process in a different way. Um, uh, in 2018, I worked uh, for a short term. It was a uh, five months in <coughs> in Montreal, and and here it was with the computer science department. They were um, running uh, masters and uh, were teaching masters and PhD students about um, graphic simulation, and the professor in charge was interested in simulating clay printing. So that he could then think about how to design with that those material properties into a software design, um, but he needed the, the lab. He did not have uh, the facilities. <laughs> he had the form labs printers, the Stratus printer. They had access to laser cutters, but no one with the knowledge on how to put together the the clay printing. So he hired me to come to to Montreal for five months, get it set up. Um, um, build the connections with the local artists, um, figure out which material to use, and, and then kind of teach them the basics of the design so that they continue uh, the research. Um, <clears throat> so I developed just simple sets of test patterns looking at overhangs. Um, we, they always like to work with these, uh, with the, um, what is it, the Stanford rabbit, I think they call it. Um, the, that's kind of their icon of, of uh, you know, developing it into their, their software. Um, so we printed a few of the rabbits. And then they looked at things that were influencing the transformation of the clay um, while, at, while it dried. And so in the lower right, we can see where <coughs> we always, this example I printed in a clockwise direction. And this was a pure extrusion. But because of the way that the clay was coming out of the printhead and the, the motion of the printer running clockwise, when the clay dried, it twisted itself in that direction. And it had to do with the stacks of layering the clay on top of each other. And as it dried, it actually changed shape according to those, um, those uh, parameters. Um, looked at things like sloping and the way that the additions of layers would would change the, the, the final result. You know, this was, this was actually designed with a 48 degree cantilever, but the print curve was, um, was modified by the subsequent layers. So, so um, and, I, and I paid attention to this because they were wanting to know how to simulate this result during the process, you know, how to predict this, this, uh, uh, these happenings. Um, this piece was actually drying, um, uh, was a very fine detail. I think we did a 0.5 millimeter layer of structures and there was a, a one or two millimeter layer uh, a wall. So very kind of fine detailed um, uh, print layers. And, and oh, I see here it's the two millimeter wall thickness <laughs> actually, um, but they were half millimeter layer structures and the print would dry before we got to the top. So it actually changed the shape of the print as we were printing. Um, this wall here, again, was straight while printing, um, but, uh, but had these uh, waves in it um, because of the, the different drying and shape changing processes. <clears throat> um, of course, uh, when the tension became too great between this wet and dry clay, we would have this release of energy and, and would split. Um, and other times it would be more curved. Um, and I think it might have had to do with the structure of the clay. Um, if it was very smooth, we tended to have larger bursts like you might see on the right. But if it was a bit, um, bit more gritty in the clay, it, the, the structure seemed to be more stable and, and held together. It dealt with that tension in a, in a better way. Um. <clears throat> So again, I think these are the two clay tests or two clay uh, types that there was testing at the time. Um, you know, how did we mix it? Uh, what was the weight content and that kind of stuff. <coughs> and then the one on the upper left, of course, I touched it while it was still wet. <laughs> but it was also fun to, to experiment or to see this, this like semi structure that was in the clay after, after it was printed. 
Um, these, uh, it's interesting with these uh, twisted crosses um, that, that was able to, to I, I think I, I split a, a cross um, that started in one orientation at the bottom and finished in another orientation at the top so that it was a designed uh, twist. Um, and again, the twist would, as the clay dried, it would actually increase that, that twist. Um, and found that the materials uh, had a difference in, in how far it would twist. Um, again, which if I went clockwise or I went counterclockwise would affect also that twist. <clears throat> so some of these small details, um, you know, had profound effects with dealing with these kind of very fine uh, geometries. And the lower examples are some double wall uh, structures that, that I designed uh, with, with the Grasshopper software. And I tried to look at these items um, because they're not something you could make um, with any other clay process. Um, <clears throat> I mean, yes, you could make two shapes and then weld them together, but as a continuous process to make a double walled structure would be um, very difficult. Um, the slip casting is, is kind of another type of clay than, than this. And I was trying to think what can 3D printed clay um, what can be made with 3D printed clay that cannot be made with any other method? And, and I use that as a way to formulate, uh, you know, what next steps I would want to take with, with working with clay. <clears throat> this is the taxonomy of the pieces we produced. Some of them fired, some of them not, um, but, uh, but was an interesting set of experiments. And we also made the same piles of, of coiled uh, clay that, that everybody starts with <laughs> in this process. So it was 2018 that I finished or, you know, last work with clay on a larger scale. And since moving to Zurich, um, worked, uh, been working as an architect and uh, focusing entirely on the digital tools. And I'm not gonna go into much detail, but it's a very large contrast. And, and as preparing for these uh, two weeks visit, learned that I'm missing that material and aspect in, in what I'm doing in life. Um, I mean, these are, kind of very interesting digital tools, solving, looking at uh, interesting uh, um, questions about, you know, uh, where's privacy in a public space or, or how to understand the shadow, the effects of shadows or distance between buildings and how to measure spaces. But it's missing that tactile quality of working with my hands and, and combining that in digital technology. And so um, in that respect, I'm really looking forward to these two weeks to kind of start that, that process ag again. So, yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for mm -hmm. your presentation. We can have one or two questions and then we can have a small break um, and discuss. Uh, so, oh. one second. <laughs> so, <clears throat> very nice uh, presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was looking at your slides and you showed uh, the three D printed um, geometry, and then right next to it, uh, the one with the little crack on the side, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was immediately uh, thinking about the difference between. Um, Western and Japanese aesthetics mm -hmm. in that uh, the Western aesthetic, you know, that we value sort of perfection of the perfect sphere, mm -hmm. whereas in Japanese aesthetics, you know, they like to have the perfect sphere, but then break it and <laughs> have it return to nature. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I'm wondering, I, I think, I think this, uh, you know, because you're, a lot of it is trying to um, uh, be as, uh, as close as possible to the mathematical or design or structures. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering, you know, in this uh, sort of uh, difference between Western and Japanese, if, uh, if we are really trying to push it as, as far as possible, you know, from, from that more organic mm -hmm. Japanese way of doing it mm -hmm. by really trying to be as, uh, as close as possible to the to the mathematical to the conceptual mm -hmm. so that's sort of my thought i don't know if there's a question but i wonder what what your <laughs> yeah, yeah what's your reaction to that mm. idea yeah that um that crack was actually a very interesting moment to 
to see happen because it's, it's when we realize that there, there is stress in the system that you know, has to release. And it starts with something small and then you know, jumps in, in a big jump. Um, and uh, from the technical and the planning side of, of producing, um, and especially in the world of architecture, because of having to, to create something in Western or, or most of industrialized societies that people are going to inhabit, you have to satisfy a particular set of rules that ensure safety, right? So you need to be able to plan and understand the, the stresses and the loads that the, the, the building can, can carry. And so in that respect, understanding when it will crack and won't crack or likely will crack or won't crack is, is super important. Um, but it doesn't, uh, it's, it's kind of working on a difference between an object or a functional scale or the, and maybe this is, this is really a good question like Joel asks is where does the, where does the idea of function lie in something that, that we are inhabiting as a spatial structure or experiencing in a, in a personal structure? So. Mm -hmm. Not sure if that answered your non question. <laughs> yeah. We can yeah. answer one more question. Yeah, and yeah, then have of a course. Short break. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Thank you very much for uh, the presentation. You're absolutely uh, very good. Thank you. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering what sort of temperature did you fire the pieces? Did you fire the pieces once or twice? Um, they, they were fired twice. Um, I don't remember the, the exact temperatures. We always worked with the ceramics expert who, who kind of helped through that process. Um, the, the clays were, after printing, we let them dry for anywhere from a few days to a week or more so that we could remove as much moisture as possible. And then the, the ceramics experts with the kiln would fire them slowly sure. um, to, to bring it to the bisque temperature. Um, and then from there we could, uh, and they refired it slowly to allow the moisture to escape very slowly, avoid the breakage, avoid the pockets of moisture kind of uh, exploding. And then, um, and then we bring them out in the bisque state, uh, have a chance to glaze them if possible, and then refire from, from there. So I don't know the exact temperatures, but we followed the rules for that particular clay type. Yeah. What sort of clay is it? Is it the bone china or china clay? Or? Um, the examples that we showed in white were two varieties of a porcelain. Right. Um, and that's, that's, uh, yeah. that's my question. Yeah, exactly. And, and in the context of, of Montreal, we, we, I decided to, to find, um, go with an industrial produced clay so it could be as regular as possible and help remove some of the parameters that they could use for the scientific study. Sure. So, so I experimented with two clay types um, and then tried to control the process so that they could have a, a standard base to begin from. Um, and so here we will look a bit differently on how to mix materials and, and, and you know, what kind of changes does that make? Um, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we can now have a short break. There is some wine and some pizza outside. And then we can continue with the presentations from uh, our local experts and artists, uh, Susanna Petri, Melida Guda, and Mr. Vasos Dimitriou. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Thank you very <laughs> much. We can now continue with the presentations by our uh, local experts and uh, artists. Uh, first, we're going to start with Susanna Petri's presentation. Um, yeah, you can go with Susanna. Hello, everybody, and welcome the to today's presentation. Um, Susanna Petri, my background is mostly in 3D design and crafts, but I'm specialized on uh, ceramics and metals. And today, we're gonna, I'm going to present you the journey through my creative practice. But first, I want you to stand up for a bit if you want, as a bit a small exercise, if you want to interact with me a bit. And I want you to just uh, shake your hands. So I don't, I'm not gonna be the only one shaking in the room because I'm presenting. And um, I want you to follow these three moves. First move, one minute. First move, try to relax and enjoy it. 
second move and third move. Try and remember, the, remember these moves by sense and I'm gonna come back to it later on. So I hope you will enjoy the journey with me and let's start. always fascinated from the ancient ceramics of Cyprus and the sto storytelling behind them. So my research focuses on the forms of the materiality and uh, the process of making. So during um, the years of my research, I'm always going to the museums, collecting materials and um, <clears throat> improving the forms. So color has a massive impact in uh, people's lives. So definitely for me, putting color into the ancient ceramics, it was something really important because I wanted to bring in touch more of the young generation with the ancient ceramics. I decided to change a bit of the color palette and add more colors in order to recreate forms and um, recreate the stories of the ancient ceramics to tell a new story to my audiences. So here you can see a representation of uh, following ancient forms and um, using the storytelling from the ancient years by adding more contemporary contexts into them to send messages about nowadays. So it's a combination of history from the past, a history from the pre present, what we live now, and maybe a message for the future generations. Here you can see some more um, thoughts of mine where I'm trying to be more interactive with my audiences um, so after this uh, research, um, yeah, so after this research and my making, my main focus was the educational part of it, because for me it's really important for from generation to generation to teach the history. Uh, my main focus was on the kids, the young generation, but finally ended up teaching adults and all the ages of uh, the process of ceramics. So how kids and everybody can learn the history of ceramics through interactive methods of teaching. And this, uh, this uh, began from the soil, taking the soil, making the clay, interact with the material. And after um, researching in the museums and learning the history. So I wanted kids to start slowly, slowly learning the tradition, not only by the book, but from with their senses and their feelings. And uh, my first educational program, yeah. So my first, first educational program started in 2015. It's a pilot program that started uh, to um, a school from the 10 years old and it got approved from the Ministry of Education. And since then it ran to a lot of different places, to archeological museum like Geridis Archeological Museum, the foundation of Bank of Cyprus and to public and private schools. So here you can see an example of the project on how kids are interacting with the material and they're learning the history through interaction. Yeah.
they are enjoying it. example of my practice since 2015 that everything started with the kids and slowly slowly it ended up um, with new collaborations so on the more um, um, scientific uh, aspect of it with archaeologists um, oops, sorry great with archaeologists. So I carried on working with the archaeological unit of University of Cyprus and the archaeological department in order to start researching about the material and the different soils that we can find throughout the different areas of the country, just to check um, where uh, the ceramics were producing. And um, this is an experimental Neolithic pottery um, uh, workshop that we did it in an underwater excavation in Greece. So I got invited to make the experimental workshops uh, based on their findings. Um, because for archeologists, it's really important um, to research the material. So if they have an excavation and they take out the, their findings, they have to see, they have to find out from where the ceramics they were collecting their clay, from where um, they were producing um, um, their pots. And this is what we did. So we collected different uh, kind of soils uh, around the area of the excavation in order to make the clay. So here you can see the procedure of the clay that actually the kids shown you before how to do it. Um, the making of it um, by the use of uh, materials and tools that we were making from the uh, excavation area and uh, the making of the pots at the final stage. Um, so next uh, really important aspect on this um, research is the firing. Um, so here you can see the process of the firing and the building of the kiln. So this mainly was from the clay and the straws um, that we built it up the kiln, which actually you can see here, that is exactly the same process on how the 3D printer works. So coil by coil, we're building up the kiln into stages. We put all the ceramics in it. And after with uh, wood firing, we fired the ceramics. Um, so this shows clearly the process that we're doing in every excavation or experiment, experimental workshops in order to fire the pieces and find out about the my, my materiality, the minerals, and uh, so on. Here is the, <laughs> is the result of the firing. So after we have the result of the firing, the archaeologists can compare uh, their findings with our making. So this is what's happening there. You can see um, from uh, what clay, like what clays look more similar and what pro products look uh, more similar with their findings. So there they can compare what soils they, they used and find out more about the ancient civilizations. That's why it's called experimental uh, workshop. So. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about my most, uh, my more uh, like a creative and artistic aspect of myself, as um, I truly believe that um, storytelling is really important. That's why I'm uh, working with the storytelling and I got to um, experiment a lot and um, study a lot about the storytelling of the ancient civilizations and the imagery um, they had on their pots because they tell a story. And that's why we can find out about the way they were living their everyday life and so on. So here um, with this project is uh, called Berengaria project. So it's, uh, it was about a princess um, who got married with uh, the king, the lion heart. 
and she had a really lovely life, but at the end it, it wasn't so happy. So this uh, pot wants to show like uh, the white and the black, uh, the darkness and the light, the happiness and the depression. And I want always to engage my audience with the work. Um, and this you can definitely tell that this is what ancient ceramic uh, were doing with the imagery, engaging the people and let an, a message to the next generations to come. Um, so really important for me was as well uh, the making of it and afterwards uh, how my idea is coming to the making and the making is coming into a visual. So it was the first time with this pod that um, it happened in 2019. Um, it was an exhibition uh, uh, from a, a group, uh, it's called here Fikipsi. And I made a video just to start showing to people what I thought before the making of it. So we'll start to en engage with people through audiovisual and, and let them to understand whatever they want to understand. I will let you enjoy and understand whatever you want to understand. <laughs> Yeah, so through my work, uh, as I said before, I want to send messages and um, ask questions about nowadays, what's happening around us or the sociopolitical uh, aspect of what's going on in our country. Because I, f um, I feel that it's really important for us to leave something to the next generation, like what ancient uh, people did to us. So maybe this is going to be a future reference uh, for the future generations uh, to the past. So in a way, with the own style that I'm developing, I'm trying to do what the ancient uh, civilizations were doing just to make a remark about uh, this uh, country and what's happening around us. 
And um, finally, I want to finish with uh, this piece uh, because I think it concludes definitely my practice, uh, which is metals. And as you know, copper, it was, uh, Cyprus is really rich from copper. That's why it got its name out of copper. It was Cuprus, Cyprus, Kypros. And um, with my pieces as well, I want to uh, preserve and revive uh, the materiality and the different processes of the making. So whatever I'm doing, it always has a reference back um, to the past of our country, um, where if someone wants to learn about the different processes, they can look up to, to my pieces and start um, realizing the different processes, techniques of the making. So this is a copper and it's um, repoussé. So everything is cut by hand and work um, uh, differently by hand, piece by piece. Um, so I pass the, like the, um, uh, the copper from a mill to become thin and start working um, um, slowly, slowly on every piece. And this is, if you go to the Archaeological Museum or any museum in Cyprus, you're gonna see small um, jewelries, which actually they use exactly the same techniques. Um, I'm gonna show you the last audio visual, which actually is the concept about uh, this project. Um, it was a project that I did with uh, Bombay Sunfire International. So it's a gin company, <laughs> but they wanted to focus more into the artistic um, perspective of um, uh, how um, uh, artists in Cyprus can develop a, a, a job by reusing, let's say, their um, glass or uh, from the bottle of the gin in order to produce an artistic piece. And so I did uh, this for them. And all the glasses that you can see here, they're made out of the reusable material of uh, the melted bottle of uh, the gin. And this is into the Archaeological Museum of Cyprus. So if you haven't been yet, uh, you will see some. So I'm gonna let you with uh, this video and um, the most important part for my practice is definitely the preservation, the revival and the educational uh, part, aspect of it, which is really important for me. Um, as well, I can definitely see why technology is really important in our everyday lives and how these two can come together. But always uh, whatever the mind forgets, the body remembers, so I'm a believer of that. That's why I decided to go into the craft aspect that, rather than um, the more technological. But I definitely that, um, believe that these two, they can coexist and work, perf work perfectly together. So whatever the mind forgets, the body remembers. So I want you to stand up, please. <laughs> so three movements. And you will never forget these movements. They are the three most important steps of making the ceramics. First one is the wedging. So taking out the clay, the, the air of the clay in order to prepare it for the making. Next step, coiling. So we're preparing the coils in order to build up our pots. This is what the 3D extruder is doing, but technologically. <laughs> and 
Last step is the making by adding the coils to attach them perfectly, the one on top of the other. So you're ready for the first class of ceramics. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susanna, for your presentation. Um, are there any questions from the audience to Susanna? Anyone wants to ask anything? No questions? Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. So we can now proceed with the next presentation by Melida Guda. Yes. Thank you. Can I go? Can I say? Okay. Right. Um, hello. My name is uh, Melita, Melita Kuta. I am a visual artist. Um, my work is the black pieces outside in the exhibition. And I will be giving this brief presentation on, on uh, the title of my uh, presentation is Clay as Performance. Um, I'm going to be reading a little bit because I'm not so, <laughs> so comfortable just to speak like that. So uh, I hope it's not too boring. Um, so dear guests of the CNS, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, to compete in this series of talks uh, under the title Turning the Wheel. Uh, in this brief presentation, I would like to share with you um, some of my thoughts in relation with my own practice and research and my use and understanding of clay as a performative material. Uh, furthermore, I will be asking some questions and raising some provocations on the relationship of art, craft, technology, and hope to further uh, discuss with you those ideas within the following days. Uh, just to mention that I will be showing works from different chapters and different aspects of my work. So not everything will be about ceramic, but hopefully this will give you an introduction as to what I do and what are my uh, kind of questions and concerns. Um, also, I will be talking, as I said before, from the point of view of fine art and visual art. Um, so, my contribution to that is from, let's say, this, this angle or this point of view. Yep. Um, a few words about what I do. I am a visual artist working with uh, various techniques in 2D, 3D and time-based media. I have studied fine art sculpture in the UK and for the last 20 years, I have been a practicing artist within the visual and performing arts. I have also worked with communities and people in collaborative projects, uh, curated exhibitions and produced cultural events. Furthermore, I am an adjunct lecturer in higher education, uh, teaching ceramics amongst other courses at the University of Nicosia in the uh, fine art department and the Cyprus University of Technology fine art department. In my work, I, in my work I often use materials information, recollections that are directly related to my surroundings, those being social, geographical, political, personal, in order to understand how these elements identify us and define us. I am investigating the narrative construction of histories, memories, personal and collective identities, and the construction of meaning itself, thus hoping that the possibility of reimagining the past and by extension the present can cre create open spaces for rethinking the self 
and the other, alternative perspectives and multi-layer readings. I have also been searching these topics, not only through my visual work, but also through uh, theater and performance, as I'm also working with such specific performances, device, device theater, and uh, a lot of work within the performative arts. Um, although I often use material, um, I guess, although I often use material that is directly linked to my biography, the content is chosen not only for its autobiographical value, but because it enables me to investigate the limits of authenticity and integrity. In my work, I often use handmaking processes and direct manipulation with the material, whether that is two-dimensional, like in collage, or three-dimensional, like in paper sculptures, found objects, and ceramics. How do we define or understand objects of art, craft, and design? How do these categories cross, blend, and meet? How do we connect and interact with objects that function, communicate, or fail? In short, how do objects, materials perform? I would like to share with you two chapters of my work, quite different in terms of material, that I have been negotiating with these questions. So I think is the next. Yes. Ghosts, which is the title of this piece, are a series of fragile paper sculptures replicas from vessels and objects I have inherited from my grandparents. A metamorphosis by the process of layer building is performed on these objects as their shape is reproduced into paper thin surface, functional no more. The translucency of the fibers turn the paper casts into an empty shell, the index of an absent matter. The result is a form that has already passed into the world of specters. Objects, once used, valued, loaded with stories and presented as distant memories of themselves. It is, and it is precisely the relationship of the memories and the hollow that I find fascinating as it seems to take place on the interface of ghostliness. I'm very interested in how, the, in the ways, for example, these materials uh, were once solid, were once functionable, by, but by reversing the material and by reproducing them with paper, that not only they're functional no more, but if, they, uh, uh, if you try to contain anything inside them, anything solid or liquid, they will fail, they will get destroyed. So they become most like memory ghosts or memory images of themselves. Parallel to this body of work, ghosts, um, I have working with ceramics as a material with opposite values and properties. What I find interesting is how ceramic as a material endures and resists through time. How ceramic objects survive their owners and by extension, how the material becomes an agent that contains and transmits information and knowledge through generations linking the past with the present. Um, just as, uh, as an extension to this, I, I like to say how I find interesting the, the archaeological museum and the objects of the archaeological museum in terms of information. So if you think about all these objects, how they contain information, then they trust me. So, so we can relook at the archaeological museum, not only as a space that displays objects, but as a library of information, because ceramic and clay being the only material that we have, um, the, one of the eldest material we have uh, to reconnect with the past. I'm creating shapes that suggest or imply function, a function that is unclear. They are familiar and at the same time strange. For, making the, for the making of these objects, I'm using different techniques like the pottery wheel, hand building and mold pressing. They're inspired by mechanical parts, packaging material, agricultural tools and everyday objects of my surroundings. They are uncompleted 
and any assembling combination generates new possibilities for their existence. Um, so they become more like totems if you try to put them together. I'm very interested in these things of fragments that they can exist by themselves as fragments or as memories or as um, kind of loose connection with objects, but by assembling them, they become something different. They become totems, they become, um, um, they have a different function and the combinations are always limitless of what else they can produce. Uh, also by positioning them as a, um, uh, as a group directly on the floor, they become an excavation site, which is something I find very interesting. A reference to a contemporary archeological discovery. Very much like the case of archeological findings, the viewer is invited to construct a narrative and fill in the gaps. What, this ob what, um, what are these objects? What is their purpose? And, and who do they belong to? How can we create meaning out of fragments? How do they perform as a site of speculation? So thinking about clay uh, as a material that goes back into time and the origins of humankind. Um, my next example, which is this, is an investigation on archeology span and the re-envisioning of the past as a contemporary praxis. In the video installation, which I'm presenting here, titled, There Used to Be an Other, which was presented in the Yard Residency in 2020 uh, in Limassol under the title Suspended World. Um, we presented this installation with this dual video projection together with Pascal Caron, who was a performer in this uh, video. Uh, I have worked with clay and ceramics as an agent of ancient practices in a contemporary way through time-based media that have been video, sound, and performance. The work, is a comment on the idea that there were other human species before us or contemporary with Homo sapiens who were also the same in as much as they belonged to the same genus. This is long before the idea of the other was submitted to the biopolitical variations of identities, to the problematic categories of races and ethnicities. Again, the installation was presented as an interface of ghostliness where memories uh, meet their virtual space. Uh, I will be showing you now, which is most probably the next slide, um, two minutes uh, of this uh, video that I have uh, uh, presented in this show. Um, the whole piece was 24 minutes. It was quite uh, long and it was projected as a dual projection in the, in the space. And it was a, a planning loop. So I can just show you a small sample of that.
Well, that was, as I said, that was um, uh, 24 minutes, it was just a small fragment. So to continue, my research focuses on the use of clay and by extension ceramics as a primal material investiga investigated through tactile experiences and physical associations to the body, that being performance art, and through the use of technological media, visual, audio, and sound. It's, it is challenging the materiality of clay. Um, that is the fact that the clay is malleable. It can transform from um, a dry to wet uh, to dust and back again into um, uh, ceramic through vertification. Um, it has kind of recycling effect. Uh, beyond the form, the object and the material, in this work, it became a skin, flesh. It became a part of a ritual that focuses on primal, animalistic, and the human. Through the use of time-based media, it suggests a conceptual practice that integrates the artist, the medium, and the notion of time. And one of the questions that interests me quite a lot is how can we think of clay in terms of dematerialization and ceramics as a post-object? What goes beyond the form, beyond the object, beyond the material? How can we push this into kind of more intellectual, into a different um, a point of view in relation with this material. What happens when the object, the material, is not physically present anymore in space, but it becomes a digital representation, an image or a sound. So already here uh, through this work, I have, I have tried to move away from the physical object and play with the representation of it. Even the sound in the video was generated by some echoes and some um, uh, um, well, I suppose sensors that my musician used to, in order to produce some of the dripping sounds. So beyond the form, beyond the objects, how can we rethink about this material? Um, so re to return to our workshop for this week, um, I would like to ask some questions. Um, I will extend the question of what happens when the maker the artist is not physically involved in the making processes, but she or he is involved in conceptualizing the process that produced the object. Suppose maybe that connects a little bit to Joel's uh, work of, of not being physically involved in something, but being intellectually involved in something um, with the objects. How do, we how do we imagine remote making um, beyond the industrial production? Can lab technicians be synonymous to craftsmen or women? And is there a thing, can we call, is there a thing that we can call digital craft? Can we name such thing? Does it exist, exist? If craft is always connected with something that is handmade and human made, is there a thing such as digital craft? Um, how do we learn? Is a question that really interests me. How do we learn? How do we bridge haptic engagement and techniques and the importance of tacit, practical, and embodied knowledge together with digital and technological practices. I find the question really interesting from a theoretical point of view and the process fascinating, although I haven't used it myself 3D printing so far. As one observes in the case of the 3D printing, in the, material, the materialization of the object happening in front of one's eyes, here is another kind of performance, a remote performance, a technological lateral precision of flow and rhythm, another kind of dance, a metamorphosis of digital binary data into physical form through an analog matter, clay. So I'm also thinking of this as a performative way of working with the clay, as a, almost as a performance art, art through a technological way. So going back to archaeology, it is interesting to observe that if a clay tablet, and the example I'm giving here is from the Cipro, Ciprominion uh, uh, era, that's 1230 um, to 1050 BC, and it's called a clay tablet because it contains information. So it was made to contain information. Then in 2002, it was created by information. So I'm very interested in this kind of dialogue that is between these two objects as made by information containing information. However, beyond the technological fascination, I must say, must admit that I'm also quite skeptical. Um, as it is easy to be seduced by sophisticated emergent technologies and become obsessed with the how, 
as opposed to the why something is made. I am also skeptical about being skeptical. So it's a kind of double thing, uh, double bind thing. As one can easy, as one can easily fall into the uh, somehow naive or romantic uh, pitfall of the true and poetic handcrafted object versus the technological distant and cold product. So that's a kind of double bind uh, skepticism that goes on in my head. Um, if digital technology is constantly present in our lives, actions and experiences, how can it not be part of our culture and art making? I mean, what you were saying before that it's, it's there, it's part of our world. We, we are experiencing and we are living with digital te technology. So somehow it finds its way into our culture, into an art. So to conclude, I'm quoting technology theorist Tom Chatfield from his book, How to Thrive in the Digital Age. And he writes, all technology changes as we use them. We shape our tools and therefore our tools shape us. I wonder if this is a celebration or a warning. If our new tools provide us with new vocabularies and languages for creation, then most importantly, my question would be, what is it that we feel the need to say through any kind of language or any kind of technology that being, I don't know, digital, handcrafted? What is it that we want to communicate in 2022? How are we being human? How are we being artists? How are we being makers or designers? So my, I suppose, question throughout this work, workshop is, here are the tools, here are the means, here are the technologies, but what is it that we want to communicate after all? That's it. Thank you very much, Melida. Uh, you raised some very interesting questions there. Oh, those provocations, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know whether uh, somebody from the audience wants to comment uh, on the work or on the questions that uh, Melida raised. Yes, please. Hi. Hi. Presentation. But. I'm just going to nitpick one detail because it's very important to me sure. uh, personally and collectively as part of the Cypriot identity. There was an Cypriot era. It was, uh, um, it was a writing system and it was dubbed falsely Cypriot after I the, uh, beg uh, your pardon. I, I no, 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 it's it fine. Um, it's how they yes. teach us. At, it's what they teach us at schools, but it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's very close to my heart to break this false narrative of the geocentric view of ancient Cyprus. Mm -hmm. so I, I, I found to... it through uh, um, some information that it was around uh, the web in relation with this object. So it was directly taken from a kind yeah, of- Yeah, I know, it's on source. Wikipedia and everything, but there is no evidence that suggests that uh, uh, this uh, syllabic writing comes from Crete. To Cyprus. I would love to discuss it more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Please sure. Share your lights. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and no, I, I just feel it's important to us as Cypriots to, yeah. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Any more questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, oh, okay. So, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll now proceed to Vasos Dimitriou. Um, the, Mr. Vasos is going to share some of his work and, and some of um, uh, how he collects materials from uh, different locations around Cyprus. Um, he will speak in Greek because he feels more comfortable with it. And Melita will help with the translation for the ones that do not speak Greek. Um, yes, I would care. Oh, the Italian. No. Maybe we can put it there. Thank 
Θα σας μετακινήσω λίγο. Ευχαριστώ. Εντάξει, να διπλάσω τα μέτρα. Okay. <coughs> Γεια σα. Ε, είμαι ο Βάσο Δημητρίου, κατόπιν από την Απόχωστο. Ε, η πρώτη επαφή που είχα με τον Πυλόν ήταν το 1969 στην Τεχνική Σχολή Ναμοχώστου με δάσκαλο τον Αντρέα και την Τζάνετ Κουαρό. So, hello um, everyone. My name is Βάσο Δημητρίου. Uh, he comes from the uh, um, city of Amagusta. And the first time um, Mr. Vassos came across um, the clay, the, the ceramics, <laughs> was around 19, uh, 1969 in the technical school of, uh, of Famagust. The ceramic technique was not only known, but it was not only known in the European world. The world was aware of the ceramic Λαπίθου, του πόρνου και τη αμοχώ του μέσα από τα παραδοσιακά κεραμικά που έφτιαχναν τότε. Okay, so uh, a lot of people were not very aware of ceramic art. They were mostly, uh, they mostly knew ceramic craft from the traditional craft uh, um, pottery that was around the areas of Lapithos, Kornos and Famagust. Παραλίδα με την τεχνική σχολή όπου κάναμε διάφορες τεχνικές κατασκευής, χρώματα, επιχρήσματα. Και δούλεψα για δύο χρόνια σε παραδοσιακή αγκιοπλαστείο, όπου μαζί με τους παγιούς βαροσότες αγκιοπλάστης έμαθα τα μυστικά, ας πούμε, του πυλού. Δηλαδή, πού τον έβρισκαν, πώς τον αναμίγνιαν και πώς ε, τον προετοίμαζα για να φτιάξουν τα κεραμικά που ήθελαν. So he has worked with um, traditional potters in Famagusta, and from there he learned a um, um, uh, kind of hands-on experience, how, where to find the clay, how to process it, how to use it, and how to uh, make uh, objects with the clay. This is the first time that we had a xylophonus, which was the first time of ceramic, and it was the highest of democracies, around 960 degrees. Αλλά για μένα ήταν μια πολύ μεγάλη εμπειρία που σήμερα μου χρειάστηκε όταν έκανα τι δικέ μου έρευνε και τα δικά μου πειράματα. Okay, so he also came across the uh, technique of uh, wood firing in um, uh, kind of self-made kilns, uh, low firing, 960, yes. around 960. Yeah. But that was a very valuable experience because this is what gave him the knowledge afterwards um, in his career to develop his own experiments and his own kilns um, to test materials. Yeah. Οπότε μετά το 1974, τον πόλεμο και την εισβολή, πήρα υποτροφία και πήγα για σπουδέ στην Φαέντζα τη Ιταλία για τρία χρόνια από το 1978 στο 1981. So after 1974, the, the war in Cyprus, he received a grant uh, to go and study in the University of Faenza uh, Ceramics. Um, what was the other thing? Τρία χρόνια. For three years. Στη σχολή είναι, εξειδικευτήκα παραπάνω στην τεχνολογία των υλικών, στην τεχνολογία των χρωμάτων και των ε, διάφορων επιχρησμάτων τόσο μπατανάδες, ε, σμάλτα, χρώματα, καθώς και ήταν η πρώτη μου γνωριμία δούδες με την τέρα συγκυρλάτα. Οκ. Σε Φαϊντζα, he um, uh, kind of um, specialized in uh, glazes, sleepwear, uh, and τέρα συγκυρλάτα. And materials that were more connected with uh, um, uh, colors and glazes on the ceramics. Me parallelly with the school, in the boy of Madame, Madame Mena Silvergarden, the Philon Italian ceramist, and we left some in the Rapuya de Ochronia. We came in 
Αφήσαμε έναν πρόχειρο να μείνει και με τις δύο επιλογές που είχαμε όσον αφορά τα αιτικά, ε, στήσαμε ένα εργαστήριο το οποίο δουλέψαμε ε, το Ρακού και το 81 είχαμε κάνει και μια έκθεση όταν όντως ήμουν φοιτητής, ε, έκθεση με κεραμικά Ρακού. So he collaborated with another Italian colleague and they made their own uh, kiln of Raku, uh, where they developed the technique and also had an exhibition of their work uh, produced with the technique of Raku. Το 81 είναι γύρω σας στην Κύπρο, όπου έφερα μαζί μου τη γνώση για την εμπειρία που είχα όσον αφορά τις νέες τεχνικές, με νέα νέους πυλούς, νέες αναζητήσεις στην Κύπρο, όπου οι πιο παγιοί γεραμίστες μας έβλεπαν με μια καχυποψία και μια δόση ειρωνία. Όπως εγώ συνέχισα να δουλεύω, για πολλά χρόνια ασχολήθηκα με το ρακού, ασχολήθηκα με το στόμα και παράλληλα έκανα και μια δική μου προσωπική έρευνα για όσον αφορά τα χώματα της Κύπρου σε σχέση με την κεραμική, τόσο για πυλό, όσο και για επιχρήμη. Mm -hmm. So 1981, he returns back to Cyprus, bringing together uh, with him the knowledge of uh, this kind of new materials and new techniques. There were new materials for Cyprus, the stoneware clays, the Raku method. Um, so when he returned, the kind of traditional potters, they, were, they had a suspicious way of thinking or looking at these new materials. Um, but he continued to develop this work while at the same time uh, making his own research on local materials and local um, earth that could be made either into clay or to glazes and, and sleepware for the ceramic. That the last year, συγκεκριμένα το 17, καλέσαμε στην ΠΑΦΟ μέσα στα πλαίσια του ΠΑΦΟ 17 να κάνω ένα γραμματικό εργαστήριο όσον αφορά τα χώματα της περιοχής του Ακάμα και κάναμε το εργαστήριο εδώ στο χωριό Αντρολίκου όπου είχαμε φιλοξενήσει έναν κεραμίστρα από την Μάλτα, έναν από την Ελλάδα, δύο Τουρκοκύπριους και είμαστε και δύο Ελληνοκύπριοι εγώ και ο Γιώργος, ο Γεωργιάδης, που την Πάφο. So in 2017, where Πάφος was the cultural capital of Europe, uh, Mr. Πάφος made the, the first experimental ceramic workshop in the village of Androlico, which is in the peninsula of Acamas. It's a very rural area, beautiful with, in nature. And there, together with uh, some artists from Greece, uh, Turkish Cypriots, Malta, And, and two Cypriots. And two Cypriots. We were six of them. And um, they, they made the first tests on local materials, um, stones, clays, <coughs> and earth. So this is a school. We have a little bit of a school. We have a micro, and we have a big one. 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 We have μαζί με επιχρήσματα κυρίως στις κυλάτες. Ε, επίσης, ε, κάναμε με τον ίδιο μπυλό ε, λούστρα, επιχρήσματα λούστρου στην κεραμική, όπου είναι επιχρήσματα με ευγενή μεταλλά που αποτίδουν τη, ε, τους ηρυδισμούς μέσα από μια έντονη αναγωγή μέσα σε φούρνο, είτε γκάζι είτε ξύλα. Αναγωγή, ah, οκ. Okay. So in that uh, workshop, they have also, um, uh, it was, a, it was uh, a wood firing, correct? Wood firing gas. And, and gas uh, that they had constructed themselves in the village of Androlico. They used materials from the area, from the village of Androlico. And uh, they also experimented with a technique of lustre. And um, uh, uh, you said terrasin in gelata? Terrasin in gelata. Μετά από το 2017, μετά και από πολύ ενδιαφέρον που νέου ανθρώπου, νέα παιδιά που είχαν δείξει να γνωρίσουν την κεραμική και να ασχοληθούν, και με τη ζήτηση που είχε και την απήχηση που είχε το εργαστήριο τούτο, καθιερώθηκε μέχρι σήμερα και κάνουμε ένα εργαστήριο κάθε χρόνο. Ε, με κάθε χρόνο βάλουμε και νέε τεχνικέ. So this was very successful, this experimental workshop. And it has, um, it has been repeated every year since then. In the summer, it's taking place in the village of Androlico, where a lot of people, uh, young people, people who are interested in ceramics, but not only, 
Uh, they come together with experimental techniques, self-made kilns, using local materials. And um, every year there's something new to explore in terms of with the pit firing, um, with gas reduction firing. And um, yeah. Hey, this is <clears throat> the the near best get to the synthetic amen. San Philly, San Macides, San Dascalos, Jim Murisa and Yano Mada, and your Via Mada, the Resilum of Homada, we are for a spirit of this people. The Gamma Biramada, a Prodo Yapilus, Yamazes Pilusia, Catastivin and Divino, the business coming to a human bedding glazes, smart them, mono make it prega illica. Was in Dudo, that he got all look Sena Ilitanes. To the son of Bilot Mazim Meda, the Greek mother of Alumen, Chaps and the Silopurno, no beer, Silopurna, the beer, the Christians, Kagoshis, was a fool. This is very important. So, um, Mr. Vasos, together with this um, group of young people who have been interested in, in ex exploring the local materials, they have formed a, a research group um, that are traveling in Cyprus and they're collecting local materials from different regions. Um, they are archiving them and they are producing uh, clays, but not only clays, uh, um, uh, glazes and other materials that they have managed to fire to high temperature, 1000, 200, 200 yeah. degrees Celsius. So yes. it's quite important because these are materials from the local area that normally are um, low firing clays, uh, but they have pushed the limits of this material to higher temperatures that normally stoneware is produced. So um, if I may add something here as a parenthesis, um, it's, it's very important because his studio, it is a thinker maker space. It is an, another space of people meeting um, bonding together in terms of friendship researching exploring and, and producing results so it's it's very communal and and based on collaborative way of working this is here in the home of the home and i have by your mother ma Μα Φτιάξα ένα σπαστήρα, ο οποίο αλέσουμε το χώμα όπω το βρίσκουμε στη φύση, χωρί να το αφαιρούμε κάποιε ουσιώδη συστατικά, κάποια ουσιώδη συστατικά του πυλού. So, uh, first they also went into the occupied part of Cyprus in the north and in Famagusta, where they collected earth from there, that it's, um, it was traditionally um, uh, made there. Um, but Oh, second part? Oh, it's Oh, yes, yes. Sorry, sorry. Um, and he has also, uh, with the um, assistance of a, of, a, of a local technician, they have constructed a crusher. So they take earth from the earth uh, with the stones and with everything inside, and, and it's crushed into um, powder and then made into clay. And that makes it very special because they don't wash the clay as someone would do to um, take out any kind of impurities. They, they use the impurities of the, uh, of the earth as being part of the clay. Organic materials and stones and mm -hmm. things like this. Mr. Uh, <clears throat> Το οποίο είναι εξαιρετικό και από μόνο του, δηλαδή δεν χρειάζεται προσλήξει για το συγκεκριμένο το χώμα που αντέχει σε πολύ ψηλέ θερμοκρασίε. Το περνώ από σπαστήρα, μετά από μια σύντα ψηλή για να μαζέψω το ψηλό. Μπορεί να σημαίνει ότι αφαιρώ το χώμα, το χώμα που αφαιρώ την πέτρα, το ξαναλέθω για να το κάνω πιο λεπτό κόκκο. Και ο λόγο είναι για να δουλεύει στον τροχό. Είναι πολύ πολύ καλό πύλο. Και για μεγάλα κομμάτια, το οποίο δεν, δεν, δεν παραμορφώνεται στι ψηλέ θερμοκρασίε, mm. ούτε καλλιφουσκάλε όπω κάνουν οι πυροί όταν είναι over fire. 
so um, he, he's, <clears throat> he was very fortunate that, that through the research, he um, found this particular clay um, that it's, uh, it's quite refined and like, it can be worked very beautifully on the pottery wheel. And it doesn't give any distortion once it's fired in high temperatures or producing any kind of cracks or air bubbles that might destroy uh, the piece. This is the Periohindi Sandroligo, which is the Adama Evridera, but the last Prahomada, the Viene Cadexohi, and Tragigona Vestio, the Viene Brodili Aula, the Bichrisma, the Tom Silo Thermocratio, in an astatigos paraon the Diatus Pilus, and then Poligaloya, the Bichrisma, the Vione Miscrisimo Vio, and this is in the Almond Mestactes, Ombres, Kipune Kipriaga, Mavra Homada. Και όχρε, κίτρινε και κόκκινε, για μου είναι επιχείρηματα με τη βοήθεια του τη τάκτη, του αζεστίου και το, ο pigments, το φυσικό pigments που υπάρχουν στην ευρύτερη περιοχή, για γυρίσει στη λατομία, να τα δείτε να πάτε εκτρομή. Αυτό είναι το ίδιο. Αυτό είναι το ίδιο. Αυτό είναι το uh, which is the base for sleepwear. And the, this uh, glaze, I think that we're seeing here, it also um, uh, uh, is ash glaze. So ashes are a very important part of this uh, research. Ash in a sturdy asbestion? An ochreous, yes. And what you said before that I forgot to translate is that all these materials are, are quite pure from the area. So he doesn't do any additions of other materials that come from the industry or uh, yeah, industrial materials. They're as, as pure as it gets. This is to to allum bo Christmas bios the duyam mo ya polla khonya ine ya na lak tiket morsot sisimatos. Cheta idiga febu be dikhenu me katkes idigas presentisi sona fora to sisimo seskesi me to ebi Christmas. Sinumen para di matos harim angia. Είτε κόκκινο, είτε άσπρο, είτε οτιδήποτε πυλό, με προσθέτουμε επιχρήσματα πέραση γυλάτα λευκή ή κόκκινη. Και τα ψήνουμε με την μέθοδο τη ανοιχτή φωτιά, γνωστό σαν pit firing. Uh, so he is very interested in experimental way of firing and what we call open kilns. Open um, fire. Yeah. Open fire kilns, uh, where the, the smoke um, and the, let's say the construction of the kill will give different effects on the surface of the, of the pot, on the surface of the ceramic. And how every different firing method will, will give it a different result on the surface of the, of the object. This is because we went to Sigilates, the Gamma Gris, Madame, as I said, Tenekere, the Ravi, Vazumento, and Guillaume, the Astro Sigilates, and I said, Tenekere, you know, Briolini, to Stivazumen. Το βάζουμε μέσα στο φούρνο, το ψήνουμε στου 600 βαθμού, ανάλογα πόσο έντονο θέλουμε το μαύρο, και γίνεται καύση του το πριονίδι με οργανικέ ουσίε μέσα στο κλειστή θαλάμι, α πούμε, του, του μεταλλικού δοχείου και απορροφή των καπνών διάσπρε τη ζυλάδα και γίνεται μαύρη. Uh, so, another technique that he has been using is the use of white terracing gelata on the surface of a ceramic that once it's put under uh, a metal, literally some, it's, it's a metal bucket, it's a metal um, uh, yeah, container. container, but it's quite small. Uh, and if you put inside uh, sawdust and, and light it, um, then what happens is that the smoke that the sawdust produces will enter the porous of the ceramic, gets trapped there and becomes completely black. So actually, in my black pieces are some of my black pieces are using this method. So some of them are not actually glazed, but it's smoke fire. And it gives this very beautiful dark black uh, depth in the piece. And the technique of Christmas of Human in it, or the technique to lose trouble in a membrane to be in a mia technique of an artistic and the ribu, Stimus of Bodamia, Egypt, Morocco, and the Hectic and Hispanian to be Spanian Italia. Είναι μια πολύ δημοφιλή τεχνική τα παλιά χρόνια. Και έχει να κάνει, είναι τριών ειδών λούστρα. Τα λούστρα που είναι με χώμα ή καολίνη ή μπολ κλέι, είτε με όχρε, μαζί με πολύτιμα μετάλλα που είναι ο χαρκό, το βυσμούθιο και το ασίμι. 
και μπαίνει σαν επίχρημα πάνω στο ήδη ψημένο γυαλωμένο κομμάτι και ψήνεται στου 700 βαθμού με αναγωγή. Και την άλλη μέρα που θα ήταν έξω, πλημμύσκουν το ρηφεύκι όλο ο πύλο και μηνύσκουν οι ρηφεύκοι πάνω στο επίχρημα που κάνουν από κάτω. So another technique is called the, the lustre, lustre. The lustre um, which I cannot translate. <laughs> 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 no, the 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 chimica, ah, the chimica. Eh, <clears throat> copper oxide. Copper oxide. Silver nitrate. Bismuth subnitrate. These are the two basic. Yeah. Which are applied into an already fired pot. Um, already fired already and glazed. Fired and glazed. And glazed. And then it's a process that reveals this beautiful kind of um, gold almost textures um, mm -hmm. the, uh, once the process is done. The other technique of lustre is in the epigrism, that is, the epigrism is not only the lustre, but the ceramic, which is 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 the Καλλιτικό και μετά προσθέτουμε που πάνω με πινέλο τα pigments που, το, που ετοιμάζουμε μαζί με ένα φρύτ το οποίο είναι γυαλί σε σκόνη μαζί με ασύμι, χαλκό, ε, οξύδιο σιβήρου ή βυσμούθιο, τριοξύδιο ή υπονητρικό. And this is on a, on a unfired. This is a raw. Yeah, second firing. Second firing. Um, so this is another technique with uh, copper oxide. Silver nitrate. Silver nitrate. <laughs> um, which is called uh, luster glaze. This, uh, this is Arabian luster is called. Okay. Λοιπόν, τούτο που βλέπετε ονομάζεται copper's mat. Είναι μια υπερβολή χαλκού μέχρι και 90% μέσα στη συνταγή των 100 γραμμαρίων μαζί με 10% είτε βόρτα νομό είτε βορική φρύτα που είναι βορικό ή άλλο μας σε σκόνη, είτε αλκαλικό. Το οποίο πρέπει να μπει πάνω στο ήδη ψημένο αγγείο, το οποίο να έχει μέσα ε, γκροκ, σαμότ, πως το αδειγώ, ή άμμο, μέσα στη λάσπη, για να αντέχει τα θερμικά σοκ. So this is using uh, a clay that has um, grain inside. Yes, to, to be able to withstand the thermal shock so it doesn't crack. And uh, um, again, you were saying that it's a, another kind of um, technique of loose. This is Raccoon Aster, Raccoon Copper Mat. So, Valumento Polyleptron de Bichrisma Bano, it may be a little bit of a graph on πως το βλέπει και πρέπει να έχει μέσα η πάρα πολύ κόλλα ή εμάτσο για να είναι κόλλοιδες γιατί φεύγει η σκόνη του χαλκού όταν τον γύσεις μετά φεύγει. Uh, Οπότε ο καθένας yeah. πρέπει να βρει το δικό του τρόπο πώς να το βάλει πάνω ώστε να το συγκρατήσει χωρίς να του φεύγει από το άγγιγμα ή από το μετακίνηση. Mm. So basically Vasos is explaining that all these um, examples that he's showing Um, yes, he's experimenting a lot with different um, uh, chemicals that produce this effect, but it also has to do with what is the body, uh, the clay body of this object, and how it's applied. So if you apply it in a very thin layer or with an airbrush or with a, or with a proper brush, it will give a different effect. And, and it's a whole process that you have to deal. Um, so it, it's not too thick. The layer is not too thick, so it doesn't unstick itself from the surface if you try to move it or touch it or in the firing process. Um, so every technique has a very special, let's say, application method um, in order to. We have seen many of the people who are in the world, and they are in the world. They are in the world. And they are in the world. And they are in the world. And they are in the And these are high firing. 980 to 1020 degrees Celsius. Καρτηρούμε το φούρνο να κρυώσει γύρω στις 700 με 750 βαθμούς. Το βγάλουμε από το φούρνο με τη τσιμπίδα. Το βάζουμε σε οργανικές ουσίες όπως είναι το πρεονί, την εφημερίδα και αλκοόλ. Βάλουμε και αλκοόλ και θέλει πολύ αναγωγή να γίνει ολόκληρο. Okay. So και σκευάζουμε το με ένα τσενεκέ. Mm. In this μην... technique, 
uh, once the the objects are the objects are still in the kiln and you kind of wait for the temperature to to drop to around 700 degrees celsius and then they're removed from the kiln with um with kind of metal pliers and directly um dropped onto uh organic burning materials such as sawdust or other organic materials newspaper, newspaper alcohol. and alcohol that will uh, create a strong reduction atmosphere Λιουμεντότσεν. Και δεν φύνουμε το περίπου ανάλογα το, η τεχνική του ούτη δεν έχει κανόνε. Έχει μεγάλη σημασία το, ο συγχρονισμός mm. και η εμπειρία. Είναι κάτι που μπορεί να πει, ξέρω το, έμαθα το. Εγώ ακόμα δεν mm. μπορεί να κάνω ένα κομμάτι οψίσιο και και τρεις φορές για να το πετύχω. Να είναι ικανοποιημένο σε ένα πετύχο, να το πετύχει στο τέλειο να αποκλείω. Ναι. Yeah. So I think this is very important. What Mr. Vassos is saying is that there is no actual let's say manual or table of rules in order to uh, produce this effect. But a lot of this is based on personal experience and on doing it again and again in a way that it becomes kind of a, a mastery of the, uh, of the te technique through um, personal experience with the material and the conditions that he's working. In the middle of the cryoman, a new man live on the technique in the paroxygon of San Clear, not the Janessus, the chromata metamorphon, the Radi, a Molochus, or Yenede, can never cross to Ble, the Amas, all the stays with me, the chromatos to Borina, Rossi, the oxidant to Harpo. So controlling the atmosphere and how much air you allow into the, um, um, into this kind of bucket <laughs> that the object is, is under uh, also defines the the result and the on the coloring of the of the surface it can go from gold to this very metallic blues and and, and greens that um show in the surface so the yeah i suppose the air and the atmosphere is another ingredient that comes at the very end to define the result <laughs> Αλλά τούτο, για να το αφαιρέσουμε από το τέτοιο, πρέπει να κρυώσει εν τέλος, δηλαδή αν το ανοίξει σύνες δεσπόνα, να αλλάξουν τα χρώματα ή να χατούν ή έρθει να γίνουν που περίμενες να είναι. <συσχελίδι> πρέπει να κρυώσει εν τέλος για να το ανοίξουμε. <συσχελίδι> ε, μπορεί να το ανοίξω, να το ρίξω στο νερό όπως κάνω μετά άλλα ρακού. Η άλλη τεχνική που χρησιμοποιούμε είναι η τέραση γυλά τα ρακού που ονομάζεται ράκου ντόλτσε στα περίπτα. Είναι πάλι είναι τέραση, γυλάτες, τέραση γυλάτα, η οποία ε, τέραση γυλάτα είναι όρημα πυλού. Όταν είναι μια διαδικασία διαχωρισμού των ελαφριών που το βαρετό μορίων του πυλού, το οποίο εμεί επιλέγουμε τα πιο ελαφριά. Υπάρχει μια διαδικασία διαχωρισμού, το οποίο είναι λίγο πολύπλοκη, απλή και πολύπλοκη ταυτόχρονα. So Mr. Vassos is describing the process of how, to, how he makes his own terra singulata, which is a process that separates the uh, kind of thinner and lighter particles of clay from the heavier ones. Um, so the ones that stay on the surface, which has a kind of more refined particles, are the ones that are used in to create a kind of slipware on the surface of an object. And this is what um, is part of the process that is called terra singulata. Για τη συγκεκριμένη τεχνική είναι επιλέγουμε άσπρο ε, stoneware πυλό χωρίς καθόλου άμμο μέσα, πολύ ψηλό και αν έχει να είναι πάρα πολύ ψηλή άμμο και όταν είναι ομόνο εφαρμόζει μια άσπρη σιζιλάτα η οποία άσπρη σιζιλάτα επιτυχαίνεται με τον μπολ κλαί το οποίο είναι οι γεραμίστες ξέρουν το μπολ κλαί είναι ένας κολοϊδής άσπρος πυλός, ο μπλέτζιγος ο οποίο εφαρμόζεται πάνω στο ξερό ομόνο αγκίο και μετά, όταν στεχνώσει, εφαρμόζουμε πάνω την κόκκινη στη γυλάτα, την οποία είναι, μπορεί να το χρώμα της ποικίλει από περιοχή σε περιοχή και από περιεκτικότητα όσον αφορά το ασβέστη και το σίδερο. Είναι um, describing the process to, uh, that is called terra singulata dolce. And um, this technique is applied, the, the, this sleepwear that he was describing before, is applied onto a, a, raw, material, a raw object before it's fired. Um, it's the white one, and then other the the red one on top. You were saying. The red one, the top. Pano vazumen do koki, no? Che meta psinu mundo se ni agushu se vdominda me ni agushu zogronda va mis kelsiu. Che odan kriosi sanafurnizu mendan kia. Eri risko na to 
να το κάνω στο κρύωμα. Διότι η θερμοκρασία στο κρύωμα είναι πάντα σταθερή. Οπότε προτιμώ να το βγάλω, να το ξαναψήσω στου 600 με 615-20 βαθμού. Το βγάλω από το φούρνο, το βάλω σε αναγωγή. Και όπου είναι η κόκκινη στη ζυλά, θα γίνονται τα κρακλέ, είναι τα κομμάτια που έχω μέσα στην άλλη. Τα κρακλέ τα μαύρα, και όπου είναι άσφρη στη ζυλά, θα γίνεται μαύρα. So by controlling the temperature at different times, um, uh, he, he describes the process of one of the objects that is outside that, it, that the result is this kind of crackling. Um, you see this kind of cracks on the surface. Um, and it's by firing the object two times and taking it out at a time where it's, it's, it's safe. So it doesn't, um, uh, uh, it doesn't crack and refiring. Then the rhythm of the neuron is that the technique is not going to be able to Σίγουρα να ξεφλουδίσει η ζυγίλα, δεν είναι κάτι πολύ ευαίσθητο σαν επίχρησμα, ότι πρέπει να είμαστε πολύ προσεκτικοί. Mm -hmm. um, this process, with this process, uh, he doesn't uh, throw it in the cold bucket of water, like you would normally do with a raccoon, um, because it will just flake, the, the, the slipware will flake out of the, the surface of the object, um, but you kind of wait for it to, to cool naturally. You know? Πολλές οι τεχνικές, πολλά τα θέματα, μπορούμε να μιλώ όλη μέρα. Αλλά νομίζω ότι... Είναι σημαντικό να πούμε κάτι για τη σχολή, να πούμε κάτι για τη σχολή, να πούμε κάτι για τη σχολή, να πούμε κάτι για τη σχολή. Οκ, θα πω αυτό. Θα πω ότι θα πω ότι θα πω ότι οι τεχνικές που ξέρει και οι τεχνικές που ξέρει είναι πολύ εντελώς και μπορούμε να είμαστε εδώ και να μιλήσουμε για πάντα. Uh, I just want to add that um, as my teacher and as a figure that he's, he has been extremely inspiring for young generations and young people who are interested with um, uh, ceramics around the island, um, he has been a kind of inspiring and leading figure and a teacher for us many. So it's, it's great to have him uh, here and it's great to have him as uh, our teacher um, for the past years and for the years to come. And it's he's an artist that goes beyond tradition and beyond um, the things he knows, but is always in research and always in experimentation and always in this kind of um, uh, uh, process of learning new and pushing materials to the limits. So it's it's a it's a very very inspiring um, artist for us to have around in our lives. Yeah, well.